This episode of Rainbow Brain Skull is brought to you by the Larger Consciousness System. What is the Larger Consciousness System? It's everything. It is the absolute unbounded manifold that is reality. It's the entirety of consciousness, and at the deepest level, you are that consciousness. Otherwise, how are you experiencing anythingness right now? You're it. You're an eternal, individuated unit of consciousness. Get over it. Or, I don't know, don't get over it, but uh, my guest today is the amazing Tom Campbell. He's the author of My Big Theory of Everything trilogy. He's a physicist who's worked for NASA, and he's got my favorite model of simulation theory and why this is all a virtual reality, and he just has the best way of like putting things in, in words that, that merge the, the spiritual and the, the hard physics, and I think it's just an absolute delight. And we've all heard that this reality is a simulation before and that we're all one, it's all love, and we're all eternal, and everything is okay, and it's, it's easy when like new agey woo-woo people say it or whatever, but it's, uh, how do you arrive at that from like a physics standpoint? It's like, uh, where does free will come into play? How come things aren't perfect? Why is there entropy? What is everythingness? I've been a fan of Tom's for a very long time. I watch his YouTube, uh, just constantly. He's like really long lectures. It's like really uh, satisfying to me. And it was so cool to have him on the show and hear him talk about these concepts I've been thinking about for a long time and trying to explain using these terms I pretend to understand. So this is a a really, really good one. Prepare to have your entropy lowered. And please welcome the one, the only, Tom Campbell. Hit it! Welcome to the Rainbow Rings Tom Campbell, welcome to the Rainbow Brain Skull podcast. This is very surreal for me because I've watched your YouTube for a very long time and you are the modern version of like, let's say in the 50s, if I looked at the man inside of the television and wanted to have a conversation with him, that would be pretty unlikely. But now we're living in a world where the man I see on the television, I can summon into my own realm and have a discussion with and i think just uh that that is a great time to be alive so welcome to the show well thank you very much and i agree with you that's a wonderful part about this um this internet and the information revolution is that uh you know that that playing field is level now anybody who has good content can publish it on the internet and you don't have to go through that that middleman that is the uh kind of the judge of of uh, what everybody should hear. So I think it's wonderful too. So I'm glad to be here. Yeah, the the meek shall inherit the earth, I suppose, <laughs> in in a good way. So um it's so hard to decide where to even begin with you. The the main thing that the main takeaway that you uh teach people and I think you're one of the best, if not the best. I'm just going to go ahead and give you the trophy for it right now. The best <laughs> teacher of open-minded skepticism, which is don't believe anything, but don't not believe it either. You don't have to kick it away from the door, but you don't have to let it in the door either. And that's a much better way to go through life than just clinging on to little beliefs or just clinging on to your skepticism, because both ways, you're not taking an active role in life. You're just setting the, the switch to like, okay, turn away all ideas except for these ones, or accept any idea if it sounds novel and fun in that time. And um, yeah, it's just, it it changed uh, the way I look at things a lot because, uh, especially because you being a physicist and I come from a family of, you know, scientists, engineers, very materialist leaning, not religion, which is good. I wouldn't have traded that for anything, but then it gets harder to get into the spiritual side of things for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. Um, the non-physical, whatever you want to call it. But um, I feel like I've been talking too much now. So I want to, uh, <laughs> I want to, let's see, ask you. Um, well, I can, your... comment, I can comment a little oh, on what please you said. do. And that is that uh, this open-minded skepticism idea is absolutely essential if you're ever going to get anywhere, um, you know, valuable. Because if you, if you're not open-minded, then all sorts of truths and opportunities may come your way and just fly right by you. You won't even notice them. 
they'll um, you no, know, they'll be kind of off your off your map because your map only contains what you believe. And if you are, on the other hand, only skeptical, then you know you never. Wait a minute, did I get that backwards? <laughs> anyway, let me start over here. If, <laughs> sure. If, if you are if you are uh, if you are skeptical and only skeptical, there's going to be a lot of things you're going to miss because you'll be skeptical of everything. You won't actually dig into much of anything. You'll have your own beliefs. And if you're open minded but not skeptical, you're liable to walk down La La Lane and yep. get wadded up into beliefs and never really find a truth. And the one thing, the one statement that goes with that, always remain skeptical and always remain open-minded is if it's not your experience, it's not your truth. So you yeah. take those, you take those two statements and put them together and that will keep you on the right track. Um, you know, I'm one of the few persons that after I get done giving a presentation, I'll look at my audience and say, now don't believe a word that I've told you, <laughs> but also don't disbelieve a word that I told you. And if it's, it's weird. not, you know, if it's not your experience, it's not your truth. So go find out. It's not that hard. Yeah. It's so strange. The, the reverse psychology of it, just hearing someone say, don't believe me just makes you want to believe them. Like, Oh, they're not, <laughs> they're not attached to it. Oh, every single out of body story is, is real. Even though you, you don't like to talk about out of body stories that much. I mean, of course there's the stuff in the Bob Monroe book and, uh, those, those stories, but just in general, when people talk about meeting aliens and those kinds of things, it's just, uh, you're very clear on it's, it's irrelevant to you because that's not your, um, your experience. Exactly. If, if I talk to people about the uh, experiences I've had in the great beyond and, you know, people I've met, things I've done and so on, the person that I'm talking to, if they don't have that experience themselves, can do one of three things with it. They can either believe it and say, yeah, well, Tom Campbell says it's that way. It must be that way. Or they can disbelieve it and say, that's all a bunch of hooey. You know, none of it makes sense to me. Or the third thing they can do, which is actually the only one that's reasonable, is to listen to it and say, well, I just don't know. You know, yeah. I don't have that experience and I just don't know. It could be true. Maybe not. You know, maybe he's uh, just imagining all that or whatever. Or maybe it's exactly the way he says. I don't know. And until it's my truth, I'll just kind of put it off to the side and say, interesting, but I don't have any data you know, one way or another. And that would be the only really intelligent way to approach that. So I feel that if if I talk to people about things for which they have no experience, then I kind of put them in that that problem space because in our culture, very few people just put things on the side for later. Most of us tend to jump to conclusions. We either believe it or we don't believe it. We don't like the uncertainty of keeping it off on the side, waiting for, for further information at a later time. We oh, tend we to have it. a, f yeah, we tend to have a fear around um, not knowing. We don't like to not know. So we'd much rather jump to a conclusion and then turn that into a belief than we would have this fear of the unknown, of not knowing. So that's why I just don't say a lot of that. Now in Bob's book, I'm TC physicist. <laughs> that uh, is in his book. So you have some of my experiences there and the old Explorer tapes are published in the, on the Monroe Institute website. So there's some of my experience there, but I generally don't talk about it because it's just not that relevant to what's important. Yeah. And I think it's gaining more and more um, traction, I guess, or it, it becomes less difficult to believe as we're moving more and more into an actual virtual world. Like 10 years ago, the idea of having a smartphone with all these apps and all that kind of thing seemed unlikely. Now we're all spending so much time on our phones. And the next step is, I think, you know, audio and then uh, VR, AR. It seems like the next logical step into this uh, fractal of nested uh, virtual realities. Is that a, do you think that's an accurate way of describing it, at least from one perspective? I think it's a very accurate way and you're absolutely right. Um, virtual reality today 
for me to, to for me to try to explain that our reality, our physical universe is a virtual reality is a very hard sell right now. It's very difficult for people to get their arms around that or to wrap their minds around it would be a better uh, metaphor. Very difficult. But 10, 20 years from now, it'll be the easiest thing in the world because most people by then will have spent hours inside virtual realities that are just about as real as this one. As they get better and better and better, um, people will have the experience of virtual realities and being totally, you know, consumed and totally, uh, you know, surrounded in this virtual space that the idea that this could be a virtual space will just almost seem obvious. Well, why not? You know, I've been in other spaces and virtual spaces that were just about as real as this one. So why couldn't this one be a virtual space too? So it'll be an easy sell in another decade or two, instead of the hard sell that it is now. Now, when you say, gee, our physical universe is a virtual reality, you know, most people's eyes kind of roll up in their head and they say, ah, that just doesn't make any sense. That's impossible. Yeah. But it's not going to be such a hard sell a little while from now. It's going to be an easy sell because it actually is just better science too. It's better, you know, it does better, you know, when you have that virtual reality viewpoint, then you can do better physics. You can do better, you know, philosophy. You can do better metaphysics. You can do better uh, theology. You can do better psychology. <laughs> you, you know, it's just you can do better biology. Everything makes more sense from that viewpoint. And all of these paradoxes that you find in all the sciences, all the ones I've just named, you find paradoxes where people say, "Well, we know reality is this way because we've experienced it that way," but we have no idea why or what it means or why it's that way. Those are paradoxes. And physics is, is full of paradoxes, things that just don't make sense. Quantum mechanics oh, yeah. being a big one, you know, Const- uh, speed of light being a constant, another big one. But besides those big ones, there's dozens of others. And so is philosophy and so is uh, metaphysics and so is theology and all the rest of those things I talked about. They all have these paradoxes that just don't make sense. You know, biology has its missing link where things, you know, seem to be progressing a little bit at a time and then there's these big jumps. So those things, once you understand the virtual reality, become easy to explain and they all make sense. So it's good physics and and, uh, just good science in general. So that but on top of the fact that it makes sense from an experiential viewpoint, which we'll have in, a, in another decade or two, I think we'll make it a shoe in for kind of the next really big conceptual thing that's uh, going to happen. Oh, yeah. And it's going to be so interesting seeing your work from that perspective, much like um, like when you're trying to convince a, a kid right now of the Beatles and how important the Beatles were or something like that. And they, they don't really get it because they hear the songs on the commercials and it's just everywhere. And you're like, no, you don't understand the shift though of that time. And as mm-hmm. we just kind of move into a world where it's, well, yeah, clearly everything is a virtual reality. Like how could you not think that? It's like, no, you don't understand. Like before we just had two dimensional games and it was just a clear distinction between them. And now It's tough to remember whether we're in a a dream or not. And it does scare some people, but I'm quite frankly, I'm very excited about it. I always thought that existence was something was afoot. Something was fishy about there being existence instead of not existence, like just nothingness, a dimensionless plenum. Like that makes sense from a materialist standpoint. But the, the opposite where instead of nothingness, it's all everythingness that just added up to me more. And uh, mm-hmm. earlier you were talking about um, paradoxes within within physics. Uh, the the main one you bring up is the double split uh, double slit experiment, not double split experiment. Even though it does uh, that split. would be an experiment in gymnastics, wouldn't it? <laughs> maybe they could maybe they could get it up to that size. Didn't they get the uh, the double slit experiment? This this made my eyebrows go up when you said it in that talk in Calgary. I think five six years ago about the um so they they shoot an a photon through two slits and mm-hmm. when it when it doesn't when you shoot it right at the middle it uh and it doesn't have a way of deciding a slit it goes through both of them 
unless it's observed in which it collapses into one reality. So that's implying that if you're not um, focusing on that which reality it collapses into, it's the Schrodinger's cat thing where it's both of them exist simultaneously until you Mm -hmm. decide which one you tune into. And you said that they've done that with things up to the size of buckyballs now, which I didn't know that. Yeah, bigger. Actually, they've got even bigger molecules. A buckyball is is a, a 60 carbon atoms and arranged in a, in a matrix, sort of like a, a soccer ball. And, uh, do they come they in have, those little magnets or is that just a branding thing? Um, that must be branding thing. It's, okay, just, so- it's just carbon. It's a, it's something a little hard to make, but they found ways to make these buckyballs and, and, uh, work with them. So it's a huge molecule, you know, 60 carbon, uh, molecules stuck together in a, in a, uh, structure. And that's pretty big. And that was the biggest one for a while. But the latest thing I've read, which was now about six or seven months ago, is is instead of a, a weight of um, you know, like 60 carbon atoms, they're up to like a, a molecular weight of like 200 or 300 uh, uh, AMU, I guess, which is a really big organic molecule. So they're able to put even bigger things through wow. the, the double slits now. Yeah, so, you mentioned a toaster once as a joke, I think. <laughs> That'd be cool if we actually literally do it with toasters at some point. <laughs> well, the thing is that, you know, a, a toaster or a cement truck even, you know, <laughs> theoretically, there's nothing there's nothing that says that won't work. But because of our rule set here, it becomes an experiment that's too hard to do. So it, it's not limited theoretically from bigger and bigger things. It's just limited, limited practically because to yeah. make the double slit work, you know, you have to have uncertainty. And if you have tiny little particles, then uncertainty is easy to come by. You know, you don't know exactly where they are. So that's easy. But if you have big things like toasters or cement trucks, you know, it's pretty clear exactly where they are and the uncertainty becomes more difficult. So yeah, it's a, it's a practical problem, but not a theoretical problem. So they will be able to push the size of the particles going through these double slits right up to the point where it no longer, they're no longer capable of, um, you know, duplicating the experiment physically. So it's, it's a rule set problem. We have a rule set here that only allows certain things to happen in certain ways. And that rule set really becomes the limitation not the not the theory of the uh, double slit and um with the double slit i think skeptics of it bring up um is it called pilot wave theory which is basically what there's like a hidden variable there's like another dimension we're not looking at that's yes. influencing it does uh does that play into your uh thoughts on it or does that just kind of put the responsibility one layer deeper in which in that layer it would be computed well those things you know have been there's several of those there's a there's a thing that that's pilot wave there's a there's a process that treats uh, it almost like an oil drop um there are a couple of other schemes for explaining double slit but all of them really don't work you know they they make this they make a case where it looks similar in in the simplest of cases but when you look at things that are a little more complicated the theory just falls apart and it won't work so these are these are efforts that people have made trying to make quantum mechanics a physical science rather than a probabilistic science mm. cuz scientists really don't like probabilistic science, you know, because they're materialists. <laughs> nope. They want things to be material. So this idea of pilot waves and, and these other schemes are really desperate uh, ploys to make quantum mechanics physical, but it just isn't, and they don't work. And it's already been shown that there are no hidden variables, that that does not work. So even though they're still there and they won't go away until that belief in materialism goes away, um, they, they don't really explain much. They can explain some of the simplest attributes, but as soon as it gets a little more complicated, they fall apart. 
So do you ever think about how they'll they'll never fully go away because it's this uh, almost these forces of nature, this dichotomy of uh, the the real and the the ethereal and the real. Like there's always um, kind of like with evolution, when they find a missing link, there's like, well, there's no connection between that missing link and the other one, and the the ground in which they're dividing just gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and there's no end to that division. If it's, uh, you know, if it's computed, it can just keep computing a division forever. So it's almost like that, that way of thinking can never truly leave. I'm not sure I followed all of that. Run that by oh. me again. <laughs> sure. Um, let's see, where do I start? Basically, uh, if, if we, if there keeps being more data presented, um, that refutes the material explanation of reality, mm -hmm. the people that are clinging to that can still find ways of saying that it doesn't uh, explain it as long as you can um, divide the phenomenon further and there's uh -huh. potentially no, uh, there's no end point to dividing how a phenomenon works. Or I could be wrong in that. Yeah. I could just be yeah. word yeah. salad right now. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that as time goes by, uh, and it won't be that much time, like I say, a, a decade or two at most, we will see that that this idea of virtual reality will gain dominance and there will be very few people who would um, maintain that it is a material reality just because that idea doesn't work. And the fact that it's a virtual reality works so much better. So it's just, a, uh, you know, models. These are all models. You know, these are, they call this uh, cosmology. Cosmology is trying to model the nature of reality, model the, uh, the universe, if you will. And these models are judged not on, you know, not on some theoretical rightness or wrongness. That's not how we judge a model. We judge it on how well does it answer the mail? How well does it answer the, the questions, the things we know? We do experiments and we have experiences and do these models you know, explain our experiments and explain our measurements. So that's the thing. And a, a model is never, well, should never really be considered done or perfect because we don't know what else might be discovered in the future that might conflict with that model. So all yeah. models should be tentative, just tentative. This is, you know, this is what it looks like now. This is the way it seems to work from our viewpoint now. And that's, the way models should be. Once the model becomes the truth, you know, quote unquote, <laughs> then you've lost that open mindedness. You don't, you know, you're no longer looking for things that are contrary to that model. You're not looking for the conflicts. As a matter of fact, if a conflict shows up, you ignore it or say, oh, that's just an anomalous point, doesn't mean anything. Or, yeah. you know, you, you somehow kind of let it go by without dealing with it. So we shouldn't think of these these models, you know, the virtual reality model as, or the material model as models that are fundamentally true or false in some, you know, very fundamental way. They're just models of our reality. And they're good if they work well. You know, what Einstein said, you know, the point of science is to answer as many questions as possible with the few assumptions as possible. That's a good model. If you have a model and you have lots and lots of assumptions, then that's a very poor model. You know, yeah. if, you, if you get enough wild cards, you can win every hand. You know, and if you have enough assumptions, you can justify any, you know, any model. You can explain anything if you get a whole lot of uh, of uh, assumptions. Assumptions are basically, uh, you know, magic. You know, this, uh, well, this happens. We don't know why, but it just does. You know, well, that's a that's an assumption. It, it uh, is not, not good science. <laughs> so, you know, with, with my model, virtual reality model, there's just two assumptions. Consciousness exists and, and uh, evolution exists. And that's it. Let's... So from there, we can, you know, we can develop that model. So then you look at my model and you say, well, what can it explain and what can it explain? And you look at the, the uh, model for uh, materialism, you know, the it's a matter world and what can it explain and what can it explain? And when you do those and you make a big chart of what's explainable and what's not explainable, you find out that the material world model 
doesn't show, you know, doesn't come off very well. It explains, Mm -hmm. you know, a pretty small subset of what's important and what we know to be facts. Whereas the virtual reality model explains so much more, solves all of those paradoxes and the virtual reality model of mine anyway, also explains all the subjective experience, not just objective experience, but subjective experience as well. And I would, I would uh, make the assertion that the subjective experience is more important than the objective experience. You know, the subjective experience is all the stuff that really matters. You know, it's love and justice and caring and cooperation and all these things are very subjective. But these are the things that matter. You yeah. Know, re- you know, relationship, uh, you know, questions that you have, uh, you know, who do you marry? How many children do you have? And lots of those big questions. There is no um, pat solution. There is no, uh, you know, logical conclusion that brings you to an answer because there's so much that's unknown. All of the big questions have lots of uncertainty around them. So they don't fall in the objective part. They fall in the subjective part of reality. And that's really the important part of reality. Whereas all that objective part that's not, that's just the, you know, the, uh, what, the, the stage and the props on the stage. You know, we're up here, you know, doing a, a play. We're interacting with each other. And we've all got our own stories. And all the objective part is, is just the, the stage itself and the curtain and, you know, the trees and the, you know, the rocks and the rivers. It's just all the, all the props that are there yeah. that, we, that we play in. Well, the props really aren't all that important. You know, it's the play <laughs> and nope. the interaction that's important. And that's all subjective. So this virtual reality model of mine also does subjective science as well as objective science. And that's a completely different viewpoint. Yeah, that was what uh, that was what really got me hooked on you, too, because you you lead the path for for people following the the objective one and you end up in the subjective and you come to realize that the the objective is felt as subjective, no matter how much data you give me, it's still going to be processed by like what, you know, Terrence McKenna calls the felt presence of immediate experience, Mm -hmm. the, the being here now, like that's no matter what objective thing you present, it's still just being experienced subjectively. It can't be anything other than that, right? It's experienced by a consciousness and consciousness is by definition, you know, it's subjective, it's personal. Anything personal is subjective. So yes, there is no objective world, actually. There is only a subjective world, and then those parts of that subjective world that have very small uncertainty. And those parts of the subjective world with small uncertainty are approximately objective. And that's all the objective world is. It's uh, it's just pieces of our of our larger reality that's all subjective that has uh, that has low uh, uh, low error, if you will, low uncertainty. But everything has uncertainty. You know, if I if I take a a brick and say how long's the brick, well, I'll give it to ten teams of scientists and they'll come up with ten different answers because well, what does long mean? You know, from the macro, how short is your measuring? How short is your measuring stick? Right. Right. How it it it's. Uh, you know, to what degree of accuracy you're going to measure. If you look at the end of that brick and you look at the individual molecules, well, they're all in motion. Those molecules are all, you know, buzzing around, vibrating back and forth. Well, where does the brick start and end? If you look at the, if you look at either end of the brick, it's in motion. You can't even yeah. define, you can't even define where it stops, <laughs> starts and ends, you see? So how do you measure something? Well, the way science measures that is they give it a, a probability. They say, well, the average is about here, you know, plus or minus about this much because it's changing all the time. If it gets a little warmer, then it expands, it gets a little colder, it contracts. That that brick is changing its length at the micro level all the time, very quickly. And even at the macro level, it's changing all the time with temperature and humidity and, and other things. So there really is no exact, perfect true length of that brick. It's undefined. And so is it with everything. Anything that's measurable 
also has an error involved with that measurement. You can't measure something to an infinite number of decimal places. There's always some error to where your measurement ends. And after that, uncertainty goes forward. So there really is no objective reality. There's only a part of reality that is approximately objective because the uncertainty is small. So from the macro world, that length of that brick, the uncertainty in it is very small. You know, it's like plus or minus maybe a half a millimeter or a quarter of a millimeter yeah. would be would be the uh, you know the length of that brick, and then every brick would be a little different length because you know they're all not going to be precisely identical. So then you take an average over you know a thousand bricks and say, well, on the average they're about this plus or minus a certain amount, and that's how science would look at a length. There is no absolute measurement of anything. So everything we deal with, we actually deal with with uh, probability. So when we start looking at little things like electrons and photons and buckyballs and things like that, you, as, as you can imagine, there's much more uncertainty involved with it, which means yeah. it's, it's, it's less and less objective, you see. And we turn turns out that all those particles aren't really particles at all. Particles don't really exist they are potential particles. They are um, prototype particles, if you will. They're only particles when somebody measures them and gets some data saying, oh, look, there's a particle. You know, it just tripped our sensor. So there, yeah. there's a particle. Now, as soon as it gets measured, ah, now that particle becomes a real particle and has to act like a real particle. But until somebody does that measurement, it's not a real particle. It's not in our reality. It's just in probability space somewhere. It's just a potential particle. And when that measurement gets made later or someplace else, then that particle will manifest as something physical in this reality. So our fundamental reality is probabilistic, not mass. And we only, yeah. get, we only get mass as we make a measurement. And that's really the key idea in the double slit experiment is that, you know, you, you mentioned before that if you send a particle at, at these slits, that one particle at a time, that it appears as if a particle goes through both slits and interferes with itself and makes a diffraction pattern. But that's just a metaphor. That can't happen. A particle doesn't go through both slits and doesn't interfere with itself. There are no particles. It's just a potential particle. So that potential particle goes through those slits in whatever way, and if there is information about what slit it went through, well, then it turns into a particle at the slit, and then it only goes in a straight line and hits the screen behind the slits, right behind the slit. Whereas if nobody measures it, then it stays a potential particle all the way until it gets to the screen. And then it distributes itself as a, as a, uh, a, a wave pattern. It's called a wave pattern. It's a, it's a uh, diffraction pattern. And it distributes itself like that because there's this boundary problem between waves and particles that has to be solved. And that's how the system solves it. It basically requires those particles to line up in a diffraction pattern in order to not have a conflict between wave and particles when you have light that is both. It's a particle and it's a wave. So those two have to meet and agree with each other. So you have particles one at a time going through slits, but they have to produce the same effect that waves do when nobody sees the particle because nobody's making a measurement. Then they have to, to have a, a wave property, you see? So yeah. that, that then makes it a, a nice smooth boundary between particles and waves. So that's why that, that uh, double slit experiment works that way. And once that was seen back in the early 1920s, all this uh, quantum mechanics was actually created from about 1915 to about 1925. That, yeah, the that, Copenhagen interpretation, yeah, right? Yeah, right. So all of that happened then. And yes, this Copenhagen interpretation clearly said is that this reality is not physical. It's not fundamentally physical because it's made out of probabilistic particles that aren't particles. They're just probability and that you don't get a particle till you measure it. And that's not a material world. In a material world, 
particles are fundamental. Mass is fundamental. You have little chunks of mass and, and you know, these chunks of mass interact with each other. But that's not the way the world works because the big stuff is made of the little stuff and all the little stuff is nothing but yeah. probability <laughs> distributions. So, Isn't it crazy that we're tuned into that that way, though, because we're I don't know how much of it is inherent or taught, but like that we're taught that there are these little stubborn billiard balls of matter. And that's right. what it's built up on. And then when you actually think about it, it, it there's no how could it sustain that? That's like so many computations as opposed to it being generated in that moment. Which um, brings me to a question I wanted to ask about okay. the limitations of the larger consciousness system, because you've said that it's not uh, it's not infinite. It does have certain limitations to what it can do at different points. Mm -hmm. And I, I always think of things in uh, I, I bring up I forget where I turned it. it might have been Nassim Haramine or something. The nasty infinity, where it's uh, you know there's two types of infinities. The the number of uh, digits between one and two is 1.1, 1.111. That can go infinitely. But then there's the nasty infinity, which is an infinite amount of infinity in all directions. Mm -hmm. And does does that play into l the largest reality? Or where does where does the limitations of the, the LCS, larger consciousness system, come into play? The, the larger consciousness system has, has multiple limitations. And the one kind of the biggest one, looking at from the bigger picture down, kind of the outside in, the the biggest limitation is it has to be finite. It can't be infinite. Nothing real can be infinite. There is no such thing as infinity, as a real thing. Infinity is just an abstraction. It's, a, it's an idea, but it can't be real. In other words, the reason that nobody can count to infinity isn't just because we're not good counters. It's because no, whatever number you get to, all you have to do is add one to it, and it's bigger than that. So you see, so you count and count and count, and you say, surely we must be to infinity by now, but all you have to do is add one to it or even square it, and you've got something that's much bigger. And that can be done indefinitely. So you, you can't get to infinity. It's just a concept. It's an abstraction. Now, you can approach infinity. You can approach a certain uh, you know, a, a certain value that you can't reach, like, um, you know, as far as uh, temperature goes, you know, we try to lower temperature and lower temperature to get it down to absolute zero, but we can't. We can only approach that absolute zero. We can get it to where it's, you know, 0 0.001, you know, degree Kelvin and 0 0.00001, and we can get it <laughs> as just as low as we can get, but we can never get to zero because if, you know, there's inherently heat exists in substance. So you can't get it to that absolute zero because in order to get rid of the heat takes energy. And in order to, you know, for, to use that energy creates heat. So it's, it's, a, it's a thing you can't get to. And entropy is the same way. You can't reduce entropy to zero except in small subsystems of some sort. But I mean, in, in general, you're never going to do that, say, in our universe or whatever, because you, you're you not ever going to quite get there. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's one of those things that are just abstractions. So there is no infinity. So the larger conscious system has to be finite. And if the system is finite, then it has to have boundaries, you know, places where it stops. You know, if you're counting to infinity, eventually you'll get tired and stop, and then that'll be your boundary. You know, yeah. You, you won't. You might not get there, but at some point, you you have to have a boundary if you're finite. That's what finite means, not infinite. And you have boundaries. So if the system has boundaries, that means there may be something outside the boundary. <laughs> and if there's something hey. outside the boundary, well, what is it? Well, we just don't know what might be outside the boundary, and there's no way of us to tell because we're inside that system. When you're inside a system, you can't see. You know, how that system got started, you can't see things larger than the system itself because your total perspective and all of your information is captured within the system. You need information without the system to <clears throat> understand things that are without the system. And you don't have that if you're trapped inside the system. So we're consciousness and we're inside this larger consciousness system. And it's, you know, it's not that we 
you know, it's not that we just haven't figured it out yet. It's just that's something that's impossible for us to know. It's kind of a theory of knowledge, if you will. You, uh, like you us as these uh, as these apes that we are, but also um, in as a as a individ as an individuated unit of consciousness, we have the potential to go outside of any uh, system. Though we have the potential to go out to go anywhere within the larger consciousness system. So we can go in and out of all sorts of virtual realities that are contained within the larger consciousness system, but we can't get outside of the larger consciousness system because we're a part of it. We're it. Yeah. As soon as you are something, you're part of it. Yeah. You can't yeah. be the thing can't... outside of. Right. Did you, have you ever come across this, uh, this book called The Law of One? Sounds familiar, but I'm, I can't There's really a, bring there... it up. Well, it's a it's a channeled text where um, this entity that calls itself Ra, which is the same as in the Egyptian times, they confirm that. And it says mm-hmm. that in our vibration, the polarities are harmonized, the complexities are simplified, and the paradoxes have their solution. And it's talking about the infinite, and people think of infinity as many, but many is a finite concept, like you said, even if Mm -hmm. it's trillions or however many zeros you put behind it, as soon as you give it a value, it's finite. And infinity is the whole thing. It's it's absolute whole. So you cannot be a, uh, you're right, you cannot be an individuated unit of consciousness and experience that unknowable, unknowable infinity. Well, the reason it's unknowable is just that it doesn't exist. Like I say, it's just a it's just a, a it's a concept it's not a thing it's not a place it's just a concept so it's again it's it's not because we just haven't figured it out yet and we're not quite smart enough it's you can't get there you can't live at infinity there is no infinity yeah <laughs> if a system is a real system then the system can't be infinite only so this gives me great comfort because yeah. I was, you know, putting all this pressure on myself to be the infinite and all that. And knowing that there's no way of doing it, I can like relax now <laughs> in this uh, in this reality frame. Absolutely. There's just no way. There's nothing you're going to do that will that will get you to infinite anything. Now, if we use the word infinity as a as a metaphor for something very, very big. You know, like I'm I'm sitting in an inner tube in the middle of the Pacific Ocean or maybe the Atlantic Ocean because there's fewer islands. I'm sitting in a, in a little inner tube in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. To me, the ocean looks infinite. I look in every direction and I see nothing but the same thing no matter where I look. And days and days and days and days go by while I float and that never changes. So I might, you know, I might think of the ocean as being infinite, but we know the ocean is not really infinite. It's just really, really big relative to a person in an inner tube. So we call things infinite when what we really mean is that they're big, you know, beyond our understanding or big, you know, beyond uh, our ability to, to even measure them perhaps. And we say, well, that's infinite, but it's not really infinite. That's just infinite. The word infinite being used as a metaphor for something really, really big. So I think that in that sense, yes, all sorts of things could be called infinite, but they're not actually infinite. They're just big. So this larger consciousness system is just big. It's not an infinite system. Infinite systems would require infinite energy, you know, infinite, uh, infinite uh, uh, places to, to evolve into. It would require all sorts of other infinities. And where does infinite energy come from? You know, it comes from that, that big source of infinite energy in the sky or something. Well, that's just making up metaphors that, ba- yeah. that basically are saying we don't really know what the answer is. So we make up something that sounds cool. And that's where most use of the word infinity is. It's just people talking about things that are larger than we can imagine. But there's a lot of what? real things larger than we can imagine, you know, this universe being one of them. Oh yeah. What do you make of uh what do you make of zero point energy, the the vacuum energy and the attempts to build machines that harness the energy of the the vacuum to instead of like explosive uh energy, it's the what is it? Internal um siphoning energy off the smallest stuff 
kind of thing because uh, I have very limiting limited understanding of it. But my actual physicist friends say that like, no, you can never do that because of entropy would would stop it. And then people are saying, no, there's ways to get around that. And um, I mean, it might be uh, neither here nor there uh, if it's all if it's all virtual. But I just had to ask you about that. I wonder <laughs> what your thoughts are. Yeah, as well, a I would you know? I would agree more with your friend, but. <laughs> I would say that... Wait, know, which friend, the ones that it's the entropy would stop? Yes, the, I would agree with your friend. It's going to be very hard to do, but I would also be open-minded. You know, There's all kinds of things that seem impossible that years later turn out to be possible. You know, If you take a color TV to the Bushmen in Australia or to the, maybe the pygmies in the Amazon, they probably would think that was a miracle and something that was impossible. <laughs> but it's not impossible. Oh, yeah. You know, It's not impossible. It's just you know, you have to have a lot of concepts first before you can understand it. And we may be too primitive to understand just how we might extract energy from the small, you know, the small vibrations that exist everywhere. But in general, I'd say it's going to be a very difficult thing and I wouldn't be investing my money or holding my breath uh, for it to happen (laughs) anytime soon because it may just turn out to be impossible. We don't know that it's possible. We just think that it could be possible and therefore, people rightfully so are investigating it and, you know, putting energy into it and working on it. But as yet, it's turned up nothing really too useful. And uh, maybe it will someday. Maybe it won't. But uh, I think if it does, it probably won't be anywhere too soon. And there's a pretty good chance, at least a 50-50 chance, that it'll turn out to be something that can't be done. Because there's some fundamental yeah. issues, you know, sort of like the... Uh, you know, the, uh, the frictionless machine, you know, the thing that can run on its own energy that, uh, that's, uh, yeah, I think they, they're playing on the same, yeah. uh, bet perhaps. Yeah. And that is another thing where, you know, it just, it's a, it's a, uh, fundamentally a very difficult thing to do if not impossible. So I would never tell anybody that anything's impossible, but I can say that things are very unlikely or, you know, very difficult but you know if you say something's impossible you have to you have to assume that you know everything that might happen in the future and all the things that we might come to understand in the future so yeah. you'd have to be pretty arrogant to say that something was impossible but it's reasonable enough to say that it's unlikely and it's all on the table but yeah the it's a very large table yeah and um do you, do you often think about how the, so the metaphor now is that it's, you know, computed virtual reality. We didn't have these words a hundred years ago. They described the universe like a big steam engine. Do you, uh, do you think a lot about how, oh, this is going to sound so out of date in 50 years when there's <laughs> different terms to describe these uh, interactions of, of reality? No, I don't think so. I think that um, you know, it could be just uh, you know my lack of, of vision about what may happen in the future, but I think we're talking about things that are fundamental here. You see, we have been our science has been growing and getting more and more specific and more and more understanding about the way things work. So today we know a whole lot more about the way things work than we did say you know 500 years ago, and uh, even 500 years ago they knew a lot more about it than you know they did. 500 years before that. So learning and, and uh, information has been growing and accumulating and getting better and better and more and more detailed. And that can't just go on forever, or let's put it this way, that's not likely to go on forever. <laughs> because we live in this, this virtual reality with a rule set, and it's only as detailed as the rules. So it's not like that detail can go on and on. Now, you can always make smaller pixels, I guess, but you get to a point where the smaller pixels don't really make any difference. You see, let's say that you had a, a, a TV and now 4K is kind of the big, the big thing that's come along in the last four or five years. And what if you had, you know, 1,000K or 100,000K to where you had billions of, of pixels on your screen? Eventually, you get the point that it just doesn't make any difference. You see, you you can't parse your reality up any smaller than that. It doesn't mean anything. 
Yeah. See, it no longer, you get to a point where there's no more significance in breaking it into smaller pieces. So, because your physiology is limited by what what data well, it can take in and process. Well, sure. You look at a screen that's got a billion points on it, as opposed to what uh, you know, fifty million points on it, and you, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Now, you may be able to build a machine that can tell the difference, but eventually, you can make them so small that the machines can't tell the difference either. So, it's not like these things can, will go on forever. You get to a point that that uh, any more reduction in accuracy doesn't really buy you anything else. And it's the same way with this you know, uncovering the rule set. It's what we're doing when we're looking at science. We're trying to understand how does the rule set work? How is this reality made? How does it work? And you can get down, you can break things into pieces and see what's inside only till you get down to the pixel. So we get down to the pixel in this virtual reality and that's it. You can't break the pixel. The pixel will be the fundamental unit. So we'll put particles into atom smashers and smash them with higher and higher energy and break them apart. And we're not even close to getting down to the pixel size yet. We're still orders and orders of magnitude, many orders of magnitude, thousands of orders of magnitude you know, above that. But right down to the pixel level, we'll be able to break things into pieces. And after that, we're done. You see, there isn't any more to know about what's underneath. That will be the end of it. So I think that this idea of virtual reality will now answer all the outstanding uh, paradoxes to where we will understand the nature of this reality, what it is and what's our place in it. And once we understand that, I don't think that 50 years or 100 years from now, that will be, oh, wasn't that quaint? You know, uh, <laughs> wasn't that a quaint thing? Can you imagine these people, you know, thinking that that was the case? I don't think it'll be like that because we're getting closer and closer and closer to the truth as our as our knowledge and as our research, you know, refines and refines and refines itself. And it is unlikely that uh, it's going to be, you know, a big difference. So I think we're getting to the point now where we're really talking about it at the, you know, at the pixel level, if you will, about the nature of reality and how it's made. We're understanding that it is pixelated. It is a virtual reality. And I don't think that will go out of style. I think we've, we've hit the bottom there. And there may be other metaphors in the future that will describe it that are better then than the metaphors now. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. So th that's what, uh, that's, uh, that's what I was, um, yeah, exactly. Like the, the metaphors will, will change and have different ab clothes, absolutely, I guess. Absolutely, yes. The metaphors will change. But, you know, it hasn't changed for a long time. You go back uh, now about uh, 2,500 years ago, and you have the Buddha saying that uh, our reality is an illusion. It's not really this physical, massy stuff. It's just an illusion. Well, I'm saying that this is a virtual reality. It's just computed. It's not this massy stuff. You see, it's basically the same thing. So that's 2,500 years ago. They had the same concept. And that really hadn't changed much because that's what you find at the bottom level. If you get right down to the bottom level, that's it. Well, 2,500 years ago, the idea of a virtual reality didn't exist. So the Buddha couldn't have said, oh, yes, this is a virtual reality because you can't, yeah. you can't use those terms until you had computers, you know, until you can compute things. It would have been speaking in tongues pretty much. <laughs> yeah, so he he described it in the way that, made sense to him and used the metaphors that made sense to him at that time. Well, now that we have computers and we can compute virtual realities and we understand what that means to be a computed reality, that basically the, the, the hierarchy here and conceptually is that you say reality is information-based. And then from information-based, that's the same as saying reality is a simulation, which is the same as saying that reality is computed, which is the same as saying it's a virtual reality. So all those things are, are perfectly equal to each other. They're all equivalent. And getting to the point that this is based on information, science is, is really getting there in leaps and bounds. It's, a lot of physicists all over the planet think that this is a reality based on information because that's what the experiments tell them. Uh, they haven't yet put that together in terms of virtual reality and then looked at what does that mean if it's a virtual reality, but they've They've taken the first step in that logical process, and the 
you know, the final step that it's a VR is just, you know, the shoe waiting to drop. It's, it's completely obvious and uh, solves most of the problems that science is having. So that'll all take place, but I don't think that'll go out of vogue as far as con the concepts go. But as far as the metaphors go, who knows what metaphors will be in <laughs> vogue, you know, even a hundred years from now, you know, they may speak in a language that we wouldn't understand. You know, if we read literature that was written a hundred years ago, it's hard to read because uh, there's a lot of words. We just don't know what they mean anymore because they're not in common, common use. They've, we've got new words and we've let old words go. And that, you know, language just keeps evolving like everything else. So the language, yeah. the language will def definitely be different. But I don't think the concept will be any different. I think science is, when it gets to the virtual reality concept and really understands it, I think that will, that will be the bedrock of reality. Now, there's a lot of logical consequences that we won't figure out for years and years to come because, you know, everything has a lot of logical consequences, things that, that you can derive from the fundamental things. But fundamentally, Virtual reality is good science, and it explains it all. It explains the subjective and the objective, and that takes in everything. So it explains everything. And once you've explained everything, um, then uh, you're pretty much done, except as those, that, that list of everything grows. You know, as experience grows and as new uh, experiments are done and so on, there may be more things to explain. And you'd have to, yeah. you'd have to extend the theory to explain those things. And if the theory cannot explain those things, then you have to get rid of it and find one that does. But I think we'll find that virtual reality will be able to be extended uh, to explain all those things that are, that are coming just because it is so fundamental. We're now talking at the pixel level of this reality. And how do you get more basic than the pixel level? You, know, you can't, otherwise that you would just be the whole, yeah, right? Because there's nothing the, between pixels, you know, pixels are Yeah, it. the pixel is, it's a, it's binary and binary is the, the ultimate uh, division because you have the wholeness. And then once you have the division, it becomes the binary. It's the first uh, division of, I yeah. guess, infinity. Yeah. No, I don't know that Do, the reality will be based on binary. It could be based on some other thing, but binary is the simplest. And uh, it'll be, yeah, it'll be yeah. based on whatever is the most efficient computer science approach. So our computer science now pretty much runs on binary. That's the way our computers work, ones and zeros. But that's not the only way they could work. They could work on something else other than base two. They could work on... The qubit. Yeah, they could work on different things, right? Once you get out, out of binary, you get into uh, um, qubit and... Uh, you know, in your quantum computing. And if that turns out to be uh, as promising as it looks like it might be, then that will make things different. So you, you won't have classical bits anymore. You'll have quantum bits. And that's what the qubit is. It's just quantum bits, which gives you a lot more states. Uh, it's just going to be faster and, and so on. But you can still break it down into bits. By definition, a yeah. bit is the smallest piece of information. Now, if that's part of a you know, a piece of a qubit, then that's okay. We'll still call that a, a bit. It may not be a binary bit, but it's uh, it's a bit just the same. So now we're talking about our reality down at the bit level, whether that's binary or not. And it, you can't get any lower than that. It's the smallest unit of information. So that's why I think it won't, you know, in 50 or 100 years, the idea of a virtual reality won't be left and we go on to something bigger and cooler, I think that's it. Once you've described your reality down at the bit level, you've described it. And after that, it's only how clever can you get to apply that understanding to make new gadgets and gizmos and do things that uh, right now we can't even imagine. Yeah. Do you play with a lot of the, the recent gizmos and gadgets, the VR headsets, the Oculuses, the Vives, et cetera, or no interest? I have not played with any of them. Um, I have, of course, like everybody else, been to amusement parks where they have uh, a pretty good VR uh, in the sense that you, you get on a, you sit in either a little cart or platform and the platform shakes and rattles and jerks and twists and you know, does all sorts of things to give you a sense of motion that goes along perfectly with the video that you're that you're watching. And particularly if you have 3D 
you know, glasses on so that you can, you can see it in three dimensions. Those are pretty convincing. Um, you know, if you, uh, if you get in those, you actually feel like you are, you know, flying or doing whatever they're generated to make you feel like you're doing there. They're very convincing. So I've done those. Uh, I've been in some, uh, simulators like flight simulators and, uh, some those are fun. Yeah, those are fun. And uh, they are very convincing as well. You got everything in there that you're going to find in that cockpit, whatever the simulator is made to simulate. And it, uh, all the aerodynamics are the same. It's you know, very convincing. So I've been in enough simulators that, I, that I, I get the picture, but I have not played with a lot of the, the games. I understand most of them, like the one that came out, what, a few years ago, No Man's Sky. That was a neat game yeah. because it, it finally started to work more like reality works where everything's computed on the fly. That's the way the reality works. And, um, you know, there was what, I don't know, so many quadrillion uh, numbers of planets in that thing. And nobody knows what's on those planets. It's not defined yet. And only when somebody goes there and makes a measurement, will it be defined. So it's, you know, the people who created it have no idea what's going to be there either. Nobody does. Yeah, that's going to be intense once uh, once AIs get incorporated. I mean, AIs are already a little part of it, but once, uh, you know, interactions with people you can talk to, once it starts getting into that realm, when yeah. when the, yeah. the randomly, or not randomly, but yeah, the randomly generated people on the randomly generated planets can pass that Turing test, that's going to be a, a wild ride. Yeah, that'll be... Uh... That will be very interesting, and the Turing test isn't that hard to to pass. You know, a good uh, a good what uh, what do we call it? Expert system. A good expert system can pass the Turing test. It just has to be very fast and have a huge database. But theoretically, there's no reason why a, an expert system can't very much function like a human being, other than the practical. Yeah. You know, theoretically, it can. It can it can make a very um, accurate emulation of a human being, but it's just an emulation. It won't have feelings, for instance. You know, it won't have uh, uh, emotions. So it won't be conscious. It'll just be an expert system. It'll be a very fast computer with a with a big database. That's um, you know. So we have those kinds of AIs that can emulate people, but that's very different than a conscious computer. A conscious computer is a different kind of animal. Now, I think there will be conscious computers. Uh, I think we probably already have some conscious computers, but not conscious like people, more conscious like bugs or conscious like, uh, you know, very small uh, animals because we haven't given them the, the uh, uh, you know, what's required for consciousness to evolve to much higher than that in those in those. Uh, models in those simulations. But you mean like the, the prefrontal cortex, adding those kinds of things to it? Well, we'd have to add what you have to do to get a conscious computer. You have to produce software and hardware that has the ability to make free will choices. Now, the way you do that, a free will choice is not something magic. A free will choice just says out of all the choices available to you, which one do you pick? You have the free will to pick one. So if you are a, 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 what they call it, a neural network, and that neural network has been trained to say, uh, notice the difference between males and females. If you show a picture of a person, they can get pretty good at uh, picking whether that person is male or female. And what you do is you train it. You show it pictures of males and females and tell it whether it got it right or got it wrong, and it changes itself. It, re, it modifies its own code in order to get better at it. Okay, so that's the neural network. So if you have something like a neural network, now the neural networks that we have are generally pretty one-dimensional. They're not all that uh, big and expansive yet, but one day they probably will be. But that neural network makes choices. It gets to a point and puts a face in front of it and it has to decide, is it male or female? And it can do some looks at it, but it doesn't have enough information to make a deductive choice. In other words, it doesn't, it's not going to go through its algorithms and say, well, okay, if, you know, the eyes are this big and the nose, the distance between the tip of the nose and the cheekbone is this and that. And it can go through a lot of those things, which will give it some hints, but none of that stuff is perfect 
because there's males who have more feminine features and females that have more masculine features and telling the difference just isn't all that exact a science. So yeah, we're back to the brick. Right. They can't yeah, measure. So you have a lot of uncertainty in there and where there's uncertainty, this neural net has to make a choice and it doesn't have enough data to make the choice. So it has to use a hunch. So it guesses and it says, well, I think it's this. And then the test makes come back and say, oh, you're wrong. Well, then it'll adjust things a little bit and it'll keep doing that until it gets better and better. Well, it's learning to make free will choices in the sense that it's learning how to, you know, guess better, if you will. It's learning how to make better guesses when it doesn't have enough information. And that's a choice. So that simple case, what happens is if you had software and hardware that were a little more complicated than that so that the choices were interesting for an evolving consciousness, for a, an individuated unit of consciousness, then an individuated unit of consciousness would log on and play that computer as its avatar. You see? Ooh. That's how conscious computers will come into existence. You have to create a platform of software and hardware with enough complexity and enough interest and variation and dimension, you know, to it. It can't be just kind of unidimensional with raising weights on one or two variables. It's too simple. Yeah. It'd have to be something complex enough that it had interesting choices to make. When it has choices that are interesting enough, some consciousness will say, I'll play that as an avatar. So now you have a, an IUOC, Individuated Unit of Consciousness, playing a computer as an its avatar, just like an IOC plays your body as an avatar and plays my body as an avatar. So it's the consciousness is all the same. It all comes from the LCS. It all is working for the same reason. It's all trying to lower its entropy and it just has different kinds of avatars. So will a computer ever be an avatar for a consciousness? Probably. Someday we'll probably get cool. to that point. And when it does, it will have feelings. It will have attitudes. It will have these things if it has enough complexity to support those things. If it doesn't. So we only have a limited amount of time to make them our slaves still, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the ones that will be our slaves will be the expert systems. You see, they will do whatever, however we program. They basically, they basically take, they have sensors. They have eyes, you know, they have hearing and, and sight and touch and, smell and the, all the senses we have, they all have the five senses and those sensors will send data into their, uh, into their processor. Their processor will try to, will interpret that data based upon, uh, their, their, uh, you know, all the, the information they have. What, how can I, you know, how can I interpret this data? And then they'll go in and find a, a pat response that matches that, you know, that data and how they interpret it. So that's an expert system. So if you want a slave, then you probably want an expert system that you can program to do what you want and how you want it, because it's not conscious. It just is uh, following the rules. It's just got rules and it follows them. It's a computer. It's a machine. Whereas a conscious computer is something else. It's conscious. It's not just following the rules. It's making choices without rules, choices that have no rules to tell the computer what to do. It has to figure that out. And in as much as those choices are interesting and have depth to them and meaning to them, maybe they're like us, maybe they're moral choices a lot of time, you know, ethical choices. Then you will have IUOCs saying, I'll log on to that, and make those choices. So that's why that's how you'll end up with a conscious computer. And that conscious computer will be like, you know, any other consciousness fundamentally, but it will be unique to that platform to that avatar. So the consciousness that decides to log on to a computer to be its avatar is not going to be the same as the consciousness that logs on to you or I, to, you know, for us, for our avatar, for a, a carbon-based av avatar rather than a silicon-based avatar, because those two yeah. systems are going to have different sets of choices and different rule sets that apply to it. So they'll be different. And right now, I think we probably have some simulations that are probably conscious at about the level of a bumblebee, maybe, you know, or some other minor conscious. And people probably don't even notice that they're conscious. 
They just see that they kind of work like an insect. They're already here. I suspect wow. we have things like that. Yes, <laughs> where we because that's a very simple consciousness. It doesn't have a lot of choices. They're very limited. Uh, humans have a huge decision space. They have lots of choices. So you'd have to have the hardware and software to support that very broad and deep uh, set of choices, that huge decision. Do you remember the, um, I mean, you probably do remember because you were there, the, uh, the, the discussion you had with uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, mm -hmm. where he makes the analogy of the number of, I forget if it was nerve endings or cells like stacked together on the like like olives on a piece of toast. Like you're you're limited by how many um, how many cents. What was it again? I should have remembered what it was. Yeah, they had receptors. There's a certain yeah. number of receptors. Yeah, yeah. The receptors. the receptors get information, and then they also transmit information. So each little cell is a is a you know, as a, as a transmitter and a receiver of information, they take that information, which causes them to do certain kinds of things, which then causes them to, you know, send information. So yes, and you're limited by the, you know, the bandwidth of the communications limited by the sensors and their throughput. So if you have, you know, a dozen sensors on the outside of your cell, then you can handle more data than if you only have one or two. And you can see in biology that things get more and more complex and the choices and the decisions they make get more and more advanced as they're as they have more capability to both sense and to transmit. Yeah, and it appears that we're um, we're we're doing that next level up where it seems like all of humanity is now coming together as those cells would be, like the way we're looking at the Instagram stories and Snapchat and Facebook, and we're all more and more aware of what's going on at the different parts of the world where before it was, you know, the people in China were just wearing triangle hats and like, we didn't understand anything about what life was like there. And now we're all kind of becoming this more global yes. thing and, and waking up to that. And that plays into the ultimate evolution. If I'm not uh, mistaken, is the, you talk about consciousness being fundamental and uh, everything is, made of uh, love and it sucks that we have to use that word because it has all sorts of whatever stigma attached to it. And it's weird that love has stigma attached to it, <laughs> but you, you run the risk of sounding cheesy if there's not that context surrounding it. And I love one of the, the greatest takeaways that you've uh, said, and I've said on the podcast before, is that you don't have to go and generate love. Love is the thing that is just, it's fundamental and fear is the thing that's sh shrouding it. It's the clouds right. that are covering it. And once you get rid of the fear, the love is the, is the thing that's there because that's what existence is. Exactly. And, and you know, if you don't want to use that word love because it's got a lot of emotional attachments to it, you can always use the word entropy, but that has its problems too, because that's kind of a science word and gets a lot of people rolling their eyes up in their head because they don't really understand what entropy is. But you could also say low entropy instead of love because the two of them are one-to-one -one connected. Yeah. And, and entropy, like none of us, none of us like that. It's our, it's our least favorite state in our lives when we don't know when the next, I mean, we like surprise, but we don't <laughs> like not knowing when our next meal is coming from. Like if reality operated in the way that some dreams do where like you're in just one location and then all of a sudden you're in the next with no like explanation as to why there was transition mm -hmm. like that. We're, we're very lucky. We live in a world where if I put something in the cupboard right now and tomorrow I look in the cupboard, it's still there. It's not, uh, yeah. it's not just going, going crazy. So that's like a fundamental gratitude thing. I try to remember <laughs> that we live in a, in a reality that has that continuity yeah. in it. Well, this, this reality was meant to be a schoolhouse for, for, individual aided unit of conscious to lower their entropy and you can't have a good schoolhouse if things are jumping around all the time for to learn lessons you need consistency otherwise your feedback doesn't mean anything you know you get feedback that helps you learn and that feedback only is meaningful if there's consistency if there's context in which that feedback makes sense and if everything is jumping around all the time then there's there's no context by which anything makes sense and then you have chaos and it's, uh, it's not a very good schoolhouse. Now, I guess more, more, uh -uh. more advanced students can handle more and more chaos, but most of us here are not really advanced students. 
So, you know, you brought up that, that other point about uh, we humans are now, you know, the world's shrinking and we're starting to come together in ways that was impossible before because we have this internet and we get, everybody gets to see how everybody else lives to some extent. And that's just going to get more and more and more as the number of computers, you know, proliferate deeper and deeper into our cultures. And it's, it's an interesting thing because if you look at, you know, our reality is, is fractal and the, the fractal process, I call it a process fractal. It's, it's evolution. Evolution is the organizing process fractal. So if we look at our biology, we see that we started out with single cell things and then we went from single cell things to double two celled things and three celled and multiple celled things. So we started out with amoebas. We end up with jellyfish, uh, which then we end up with fish. So we end up with things that keep having larger and larger collections of cells. And then these cells begin to differentiate into various organs and various functions. So they specialize uh, for doing things more efficiently rather than one thing trying to do everything. And that has been, that's the natural way of evolving in a system. It happened here, but it's not just special to here. That happens everywhere. You start with the system of the single cells and to increase its organization to two cells gives it more um, capability, it gives it lower entropy. Now you have order. The two cells produce something that's ordered and the 10 cells each doing some part of the whole is something that's more ordered. So as synergy, yeah, so as you right, you have the synergy of the, of the connectedness, the sharing, the cooperation between these things, which produces something more. So all of that lowers entropy. So that's the normal path of lowering entropy is to find more order, more complexity, more survivable, you know, more likely to procreate because it's a more adjustable, a more tunable thing that you have when it's more complex. It can rearrange itself in more ways. So when we look at humans, humans now, individual humans are like those single cells, you know, and, and uh, we uh, kind of, if we're all out for ourselves and it's only about us, then we're like at the level of those amoebas, those single celled things. But as we group up into uh, groups that we care about and cooperate with, like families, perhaps, or uh, communities, you know, one day it'll also be nations and then maybe the whole globe. But that is the natural progression of our evolution as social beings. So one day, this will be a kinder, gentler, more cooperative place because we will become something bigger. We will become an organism. We humanity, not just humans, but we humanity will become something bigger than just a lot of individual humans. And we will, pro Is it? We will produce something. Right, we will produce something that's unique that's never existed before as a, as a group. But it won't mean that we lose our individuality. We will still have all the same individuality we have. And that individual, individuality will be, um, will be greater and have more dimensions to it. We will have more choice and more freedom than ever. But at the same time, we will produce something that's bigger than just us. So that is where evolution is taking us. That's the nature of this fractal uh, process. That's the that's kind of the end game. So we know we'll get there. It's just a matter of how long is it going to take before <laughs> we find this gentler, kinder, more cooperative space that we all, uh, you know, that we all kind of cooperate in and work together in. But it it will. Do you come. think it's strange that it's it's happening at this moment where you know there's all this talk of overpopulation, climate change is right around, or it's already started happening, uh, climate change and some. Uh, people are, I don't know if it's just all fear mongering, not climate change itself, but just the fact that we're at the point of no return, which, you know, there's no, no point of no return. We've, we've come a long way. We came out of the mm -hmm. ocean and we've, uh, we, we have a, a track record of, of beating the odds. Do you find it strange that we're at this precipice of it's either all going to collapse or we're going to skyrocket into this new paradigm of the next octave of cooperation and, our, our evolution or is that 
Or is that necessary when a species goes to that next level? It always has to come with that crisis. Well, or is it just a coincidence? No, I think they probably come together because things things come to a head, right? Change. Change requires people to be different, not just act different, but be different. And that's always going to happen slowly. So you're always going to have some that have changed and some that haven't. You're going to have some that, you know, are going to be cooperative and some that are still going to be self-centered. Um, it's just, you'll have that. And if it, the, as you begin this process, there'll be, let's say, the way we are, we have a whole lot of people who are full of fear and self-centered. And now that number that is cooperative and caring is going to grow and grow and grow. And eventually it'll get, be about 50-50. And when it is, there's liable to be a lot of conflict between the two. And then as that cooperative and caring segment gets to become the majority and then a large majority and so on, that conflict will disappear. And the conflict wasn't that big in the beginning when it was almost all fear-based and very little love-based. So it's somewhere in the middle where it's 50-50 or, you know, both groups are very large that you expect to have turmoil. You expect to have some, some, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, some turbulence in the process of evolution. So I think that just yeah. is going to come that way. So as as we change, those that don't want to change push even harder toward, you know, their view of the world is all materialistic. It's only what you can get and what you can keep once you've gotten it. And, you know, you just use the earth and to suit us and you know, it'll just keep renewing itself all by itself. That's sort of, uh, you know, short-sighted philosophy. There are those that will just keep pushing harder and harder down that to prove to themselves that they're right, because nobody likes to come to the conclusion that they're not right. And then the people <laughs> nope. on the other side are going to be, you know, pushing very hard in their way. And you suspect that it's going to be kind of a, a time of a lot of conflict for a while to get to get through this. It's not something that one would expect that just all of a sudden everybody gets happy and becomes good friends and, you know, they all live happily ever after. That only, that only yeah, happens. It's going to be a photo finish. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a photo finish for a while. And it could be, <laughs> it could be that when we're right on that cusp where it could go either way, it could become more, more fearful and more negative, or it co could become more loving and more positive. And it might go backwards for a while. You know, things may happen such that the level of fear goes up and we we go backwards. And then maybe we'll just have to, you know, we'll crawl back out of that hole and we'll go forward again. The point is, like I say, eventually we'll get there. So, no, it's not like there's there's an end. Oh, if we don't do it here, it's all over and, you know, we'll never be able to restart. You can always restart. We would learn or evolve or what is it? Evolve or repeat. Yeah. 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 So you either you either evolve or die. Actually, if you don't evolve, you de-evolve, and if you keep de-evolving, eventually you end up at nothing. So the evolving is evolving toward order and low entropy, and the de-evolving, you know, is toward chaos, basically. So eventually, if you de-evolve enough, then there's no more structure. There's nothing. You just have randomness, just chaos. So it's evolve or die. So we'll eventually get there because though evolution is slow, it's also it's also unstoppable. It just keeps chugging. It's relentless. So even if we bomb ourselves back to the Stone Age, well, we'll start at the Stone <laughs> Age. You know, in a hundred thousand years, we may be back to where we are now, and then we maybe we'll go past where we are now next time instead of going back to the Stone Age. Who knows? But eventually, we will get there. Do you think it's happened a few times before, like listening to some of these uh, people like Graham Hancock and the you know ancient civilizations, and like we we got to this point of high technology from a different path, not necessarily the one we have now, but they were able to do incredible things, and then natural cataclysms, asteroids, whatever floods uh wipe them out nothing remains but some strange rock buildings um i mean it's not that objective of a question it's more yeah it's a, it's another one of those things where i'd say i would be, i would remain open minded maybe but i'd also be very skeptical and the reason that i'm skeptical is because the more advanced a civilization generally they're going to leave things that last they're going to leave things that don't decay quickly. 
So, you know, we can find things, we can find dinosaur bones that were here from long before men ever walked around on the planet. We can find fish and fossils and things of all kinds of stuff that were millions of years before humans ever got here. So just to, you know, just to uh, go back the 200,000 years or so that humans have been here or that, you know, they've been here this time isn't all that long. You know, you can go back to where there weren't any vertebrates here. You know, there weren't any, uh, you know, there weren't anything but invertebrates. And we still have yeah. fossils from that time. We can still see things that existed from that time. But we don't really see much that tells us, you know, that there was some very, what we would call modern or futuristic uh, advanced society, unless this advanced society looked just like a not so advanced society, which means, you know, they all sat around and watched their sheep eat grass most of the time. <laughs> and maybe they were advanced in other ways, but not materially advanced. And that's a possibility. But if they were, but if yeah. they were materially advanced, then we should see some signs of it. You know, right now, if, uh, you know, you advance time, you know, a hundred thousand years, a good, a good archeologist would find things like, uh, you know, titanium airplane fuselage and, you know, pieces of junk that have, you know, that have exceedingly long lifetimes. They're not going to rot. They're not going to decay. They're going to be there for a long, long, long time. And those kinds of artifacts should be available to us in a lot greater quantity than what we see. We see some things, obviously. So that's one thing. Now, the other thing is, is that just because this place may have recycled a few times doesn't necessarily mean it went through a physical process. It may have just gone mm -hmm. through a, a software process. You see, this is a virtual reality. So let's say that um, we have a virtual reality here and we're all humming along and we're all starting to get along better. And, and the, the love group is getting a little stronger than the, than the fear group. And just out of the blue, you know, a random thing happens and a big asteroid comes and hits the planet and then turns it to dust. Game over, right? The virtual reality mm -hmm. just ended. Well, what would the system do about that? Well, it could do several things. It could stop the simulation when it realized that there was this big asteroid about, asteroid about to wipe it out and just delete the asteroid. See, it's digital. You could just delete the asteroid and then that wouldn't happen. Or if it did happen, it could save everything, reconstitute, just, you know, it's, a, you know, what can you say? It's like a checkpoint restart. You know, before that happened, you mm -hmm. could just save it. You, Reload, you, save. You just save it and start it back up where it left off. You see, so there's lots of things you can do. So when we see, when we see um, things that look like they may have come from some other source other than humans, like the big things that what it was in von Daniken saw, you know, the big patterns that were left in the earth, that if you're at 5,000 feet, you can see they mean something. Whereas if you're on the ground, they just seem like hills and valleys, but they're actually some sort of picture or something or some kind of geometric shape, oh. and you wonder, well, how'd that get there? Well, it's a digital reality. You can put anything pretty much anywhere you want, as long as you don't create a problem for the students in the in the school. So if you want to put some of those things there to help those students wake up and think that the realities may be bigger and more complex than just the physical stuff we see, then you could do that. So it's hard to say. It doesn't necessarily mean that aliens had to come and do that. It doesn't necessarily mean that people a long time ago could obviously fly around because otherwise they wouldn't have appreciated the, you know, what they were building because you can only see the pattern from, you know, 5,000 feet or something. It doesn't mean any of those things mm -hmm. necessarily. It's a digital simulation. Digital simulations can produce virtually anything. And the system will produce whatever helps wake people up so that they see a little more about the nature of the reality so they can eventually come to conclusion that love is the answer because that's the point of our evolution. So this yes. system will do those kinds of things and plant things there and, and uh, do all kinds of other stunts. And as long as it does it in the margins where it doesn't really upset the schoolhouse, then it can get away with it. So you're not limited just to physical things that might have happened here. 
But there's all sorts of digital things that are probably more likely to have happened here that will leave mysteries and uh, oddities laying around like crop circles. You know, it's another uh, oddity just overnight, you know, 15 acres are are turned into a very, very complex geometric design. And uh, it happened during the dark and it happened over a single night and would probably take a bunch of surveyors, you know, a year to lay that out. You know, if they had to do that design, you know, manually. So what about those things? Well, you know, it's obviously not a bunch of farmers coming out trying to have some fun. They're too complicated for that and they happen too quickly. So what is it? Well, if in our culture, if you can't come up with an answer, like you say, we don't like to not have answers. So we make something up. And the only thing we make up, yeah. well, if we didn't do it. Who, who did it? Well, it must be the aliens. Well, not necessarily. That's not the only choice, you see. What do you make of the actual uh, designs? Because oftentimes when you go down the the rabbit hole of, um, you know, hollow fractal unified field theory and ancient knowledge, sacred geometry, you come up with these same shapes, the fire ratio, the flower of life, that kind of thing. And then it plays into the, the, the nature of um, physical reality too. Does is that sort of stuff fundamental to this reality? The phi ratio is it? Is it this magic thing, or is it just the one we happen to be tuned into right now? And there could be all sorts no. of other yeah, there's, realities. There's no right? magic to it. What it is is that if you have a virtual reality, it's a computed reality. If you have a computed reality, you find that some you know it's a mathematical reality. That's why, you know, science says, well, it's a wonder that our reality is so, you know, that the language of reality is math, that we can describe our reality with mathematics. Isn't that amazing? I wonder why that is. Well, because it's a virtual reality. It's a computed reality. The rule set is a set of equations. The rule set's a set of, uh, of uh, rules written in, you know, in computer lines of code. And that's the rule set. And it's largely mathematical. So you find shapes and things that, that work well for you, you tend to use them and reuse them. Things that uh, are real handy to make seashells, and they're also handy to make you know, a dozen other things at the same time. You have a nice little sequence like the Fibonacci series, and it just expands and spirals and so on. And so you can make, use that for all sorts of things. I did some simulation, and I would make, you know, I would take a few basic shapes like ellipsoids. Lipsoids a wonderful shape. You can make something that looks like an airplane, like a human being. You can model almost anything. You can make something that looks like an automobile. All it takes is lots and lots of ellipsoids of different sizes and shapes all stuck together just right. And you can model almost anything with those. And if you add a couple of uh, rectangular pieces to it, you know, there's almost nothing that you can't make just out of those. You can make a very uh, um, uh, good human figure just just out of ellipsoids because humans tend to be a little bulgy, not quite so linear, straight lines. We don't have a lot of really straight lines in us. So it just takes a lot of them because where one curve ends, another ellipsoid curve picks that up and continues it. But when you make this reality, it's it's rendered, right? We have a rendering engine that renders the physical universe. So our our avatar, you and I, our avatar has to be rendered. The computers we're looking at have to be rendered. Um, this rendering is basically math-based rendering. And to make it simple, it takes a lot of simple shapes and simple things and simple series and simple equations and simple relationships and uses them over and over again just because they work well. And it's good computer sense if you keep it simple. You don't want a lot of complexities because if you can take simple things and build complex things out of the simple things, then that makes the complex things real easy to render by the, by the server. So uh, it's the only way to scale up or it's the most efficient way to right, scale up. I right. guess. So that's otherwise you'd have to do more. Yeah. If, yeah you don't sense. want to start everything as, as uh, you know, big complex things. You want to make big complex things, you know, created by, by simpler things where you just iterate on a simple thing or run out of series on a simple thing, do a little simple operation in computer code, and then you can make something hugely complex out of that if you just iterate on it, okay? 
you have a process. That's another process fractal. You have a process where you, you know, a series is like a process. It has all these terms in a series and you take the output and you feed it into the input and you just keep building up and you end up with these wonderful shapes and they reappear because it's a fractal. They tend to use the same stuff that works all over. So that's why we have those things. It's not that there's sacred geometry that, uh, you know, is special magic stuff. It's just good programming. It's efficient. It's yeah. efficient programming is what it is. Cool. So there's one section that we do, or there's two things that I do consistently in every episode of this podcast. And uh, the first one is 10 seconds of silence. It doesn't have to be a meditation or anything. Uh, it's just it's just 10 seconds of silence just because, and I like to put it at a random point in the in the recording where we just sit silently for 10 seconds. So are you ready to do that? Ready to do that. All right, here we go. Go. And we're back. Man, that was an it was an honor to be in in that 10 seconds of silence with you. <laughs> it uh um, it's, it's creating that void brings up so many questions in my in my head. Which, uh, I mean, we we said earlier on preface with, uh, you know, don't believe me, keep keep open minded skepticism, skepticism, uh, all of that. But I wanted to ask about. Um, I also ask guests what they think happens after you die. And I, I like to bring up Alan Watts's quote of, you know, a lack of awareness cannot experience, or sorry, awareness cannot be aware of lack of awareness. It's this contradiction. You can't experience nothingness. There always is, is like a data stream. There always is feedback. There always is that thing. And I wanted to ask, um, what, what happens after we leave these avatars? Okay. Well, I can answer that one for you. It uh, It's talking about the avatar now. We the avatar, not we the consciousness. Because we the consciousness don't die. We the individuated unit of consciousness keep going on and on. Okay, we Death is not a thing for us. Death in this reality is just like the, the death of your Sims character um, in Sims or the death more likely in the World of Warcraft, a more violent game. Than the Sims, uh, you know, death happens all the time. And what happens to your character when he gets beaten and he dies? Well, I think in World of Warcraft, you have to run back to the graveyard and, uh, you know, and, and get him. And then he has to run out to where the battle was and pick up all his stuff. Otherwise, he loses his his uh, his spells and his you know sword and the rest of it. So there's a process by where you get to come back because otherwise the game would be really boring if you paid $10 a month, then your character got killed in the first 10 minutes. And now you're done. You know, so that wouldn't be a very good game because you wouldn't learn much. We can't learn that quickly. Learning is a cumulative thing. So because we have to learn cumulatively, it takes experience to learn. And sometimes that experience gets us killed. So if getting killed once was the end of the game, then it would be almost impossible to learn anything useful because we'd only have this one shot. And if we were unlucky, uh, we would maybe learn or we wouldn't learn much. If we were real lucky, we still wouldn't learn much because there's so much to learn. Changing ourselves, growing up is a, is a difficult thing. This self-change, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is uh, not a simple yeah. thing. So we have to have a cumulative experience. The whole model doesn't work if you don't have cumulative experience. So you, the consciousness, log on to an avatar. That avatar is born, has experience, and you are its you are its consciousness. Just like with the elf in, in World of Warcraft. You are the elf's consciousness. You make all the elf's choices for it. That's what the consciousness does. Well we are immortal consciousness making all the choices for this yes. body. Right? For this elf. And that's who we are. And this body does die because there's a rule set and in this rule set things wear out and entropy uh, tends to increase in a system unless uh, enough energy is put in to decrease it. So things wear out and they die. And when they die, the unit of consciousness, which by then is a thing I call a free will awareness unit, which is just a piece 
of this larger consciousness system that it partitions off and says, all right, this piece of me that I partition off is just something that represents what I've learned. It, it represents my entropy level. It represents the quality of my consciousness. And I'm going to take just that piece, no memory, just the quality of my consciousness up to that point. And I'm going to, I'm going to then log on with that to this avatar called Tom Campbell. So then I'm the consciousness, I'm the free will awareness unit of a piece of my individuated unit of consciousness, and I'm playing Tom Campbell as an avatar, and I make all the Tom Campbell's choices, and I uh, tell Tom Campbell what to say when his lips move. So I'm really the one that's inside <laughs> there that's doing everything, but um, the picture is in the virtual reality of Tom Campbell's body going around and doing things and you know, doing interviews and doing other things, sitting in front of computers and talking into microphones. And that's what the body does. Uh, and you chose a very meta, uh, a meta avatar <laughs> in that you came in here to, to talk about coming in here. <laughs> yes. So in any case, so that's the way that is. And when that body, when that body of mine falls over dead, then when, or when anybody's body falls over dead, they immediately realize that they are aware somewhere. They don't know where. Sort of like Dorothy, you know, when she finds she's in Oz and she says, oh, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. You know, well, it's like that. You, uh, you realize you're not in that old life anymore, but you're still aware of things. And very shortly, you'll be encouraged to uh, move in a particular direction, you know, move toward the light or somebody will come and see you. It'll probably be one of your relatives and say, oh, hi, you know, how you doing? Welcome. Come on over this way. Everything's wonderful here. And all of that is, it's not really a relative. It's the system playing your relative to try to get you to relax and let go. Because the point is you're making a transition from one lifetime to another. And there is a virtual reality frame that does just that. It's a transition reality. So you wake up. Is there, is there times when it doesn't transition where you just go straight to the next one for whatever reason? Perhaps you decided that like three uh, levels of reality up, you decided I'm not going to go through the transition this well, time. It's just straight. The to transition can be, can be uh, long and complex or it can be very, very straightforward where you just, you just ignore all the, all the greeting and all the rest of it. And you, yes, you just go on to the next event. Uh, you don't, it just depends on what you need. The transition is there for those people who need to relax and let go and reorient. Then that's what it's there for. For those people that need a lot of that, they get a lot of it. For those that need a little of it, they get a little. For those that don't need it at all, they just process right through and get on to the business of picking what they're going to do next. So yes, it depends on the individual. It's not one size fits all. It's custom fit for each individual. So when you first die and you wake up and have an awareness, the life you just led as the avatar that died, that, that life starts to fade like a dream. Just like when you wake up from a dream and the instant you wake up, it's perfectly clear. You know, five minutes later, it's mostly gone. 10 seconds later, it's sort yeah. of clear. 20 seconds later, it's getting hazier. You know, five minutes later, it's not so clear. And, and you know, 20 or 30 minutes or hours later, you can barely remember what it was about and all the details are lost. So that's the way it is. When you wake up after your avatar dies, you, the free will awareness unit, at that point, start to reintegrate, take that partition down, and you start to reintegrate with your individuated unit of consciousness. And your past life that you just exited starts to fade like a dream. And what this transition reality does for the average person is this helps them get through that process of letting it fade and going on without panicking or getting upset or freaking out. So it's a, it's a matter of uh, uh, keeping everybody calm, give them something to do, uh, you know, let them stand around till they get bored and, and uh, that kind of thing. So it's, and it depends on how much of that you need. Like I said, you don't need much, then you don't get much. If you need a lot of that, let's say you come in with a lot of beliefs and you, you open your eyes and you wonder, oh, am I burning in fire or am I at the pearly gates? And that's a big issue for you. And you have a lot of fear wrapped around that. Well, then the transition is going to be a little more complicated because you've got a lot of beliefs and things that you're going to have to deal with and you're going to have to let go. But they'll they'll go just like the dream. Eventually, that stuff will 
leave you as well and uh, you'll let go. So it's a very friendly, welcoming place, sort of like the Walmart greeter, you know, is out there. Uh, Come on in. <laughs> yeah, you, know, the, you know, dry goods are over here and, you know, the bread's over there. You know, and it's a it's a very friendly, uh, welcoming place. You're put to ease. You're often, you know, relatives show up. Uh, again, they're being played by the by the larger consciousness system, very accurately played. And you hang out for a while until you get bored. And when you get bored, you say, hey, what else is going on here? You know, what's where's the action? And next thing you know, you're planning another lifetime. And then your IUOC is partitioning off another free will awareness unit. And you're logging back on to your next avatar so that you can learn a little more next time. So that sounds so that's wonderful. That's basically the way it works. Now there's there's different parts to the transition, but that's kind of the the short of it. When you do decide you want to go back, you always have a choice about going back or not. It's not like, okay, you've been here for, you know, for a day, now it's time to go back. Nobody will push you into anything. You have free will. We talk cuz what would a day be right. even in exactly. that Exactly. What would a day be? So we talked a little bit. Is there a sun and a moon? No, and, there's none of that. Yeah. No, there's there none of that. Be. So it's not a physical space. It's just a, it's like a dream, more like a dream reality, if you will, except you're not dreaming. You know, it's, it's where you live now. It's, um, but we talked a little earlier about the limitations on the larger conscious system. And one of the limitations it places yeah. on itself is that it does not uh, abridge our free will for any reason. So we always have free will. So if we say, no, I don't want to go back. Well, then, okay, just, you know, stand over here or go over there or do whatever you want. So you don't have to do anything, but you get to the point where you're wasting your time and you know that and you're bored and you want to go back because actually it was more fun from retrospect than it was when you were in it. And you see that how you made it worse because of your fear and you know you're going to do better next time. So you, you do decide to go back. And when you do, uh, depends on what level you're at in your evolution. You may, uh, you know, have one of these uh, experiences where you need to see your last life in detail to learn more from your mistakes. Have some of your mistakes pointed out where you acted badly, where you uh, gained entropy rather than lost entropy. So you can be aware of it. So you won't be so likely to make those mistakes again. So you can gain some knowledge that way. And then when you're ready, generally, then you the system will pick out something for you that suits you. You'll tell the system what it is you'd like. Say, well, you know, I'm having trouble uh, with, uh, uh, you know, anger management in my life. That's what that's what keeps messing me up. I get angry all the time. So you maybe put some place where the opportunities to get angry are smaller just to give you a, a break so that you can have a, a successful uh, incarnation without running off the deep end. So you get things that are to suit you. So everybody's tried to be placed in a place that has good potential for them, but because there's free will, you know, once you take a spot, it's hard to say how it's going to work out because there's a whole bunch of other people interacting with you. And all of that is up for grabs because of the, the free will element. There's a lot of uncertainty to it. So, so we do it intentionally in a way in that we're, we're taking on this entropy and we're taking on this fear kind of in the way that if you work out, you're, you're tearing up muscle fibers so that you can grow it bigger. Like we're, yeah, is that that's a correct? A, that's uh, probably a good way. They're all experiences. You can learn from any experience, even a horrible experience. There's something to learn from it. It's not like just bad experience and good experience. All experience is educational. I mean, you're learning about how to make choices is what it's about. So some people uh, in the very beginning, when they're just getting started in this uh, conscious evolution game, they just hop in, hop out. They get out and they just kind of, you know, okay, they get, they get relaxed, they let it go, and then they're ready to go back in again because they don't really have any particular things they need to work on. They're just working on gaining experience. So then they go around pretty quickly. Now, once you've been around enough that there's certain things like anger management or maybe abandonment issues or feelings of insecurity and these things that you want to work on, then you can tell a little more time trying to plan it and the kind of the kind of challenge you'd, you'd like, the kind of too big a challenge you'd like to avoid, 
and you, you spend a little yeah. more time trying to design something that works for you and you work with the system to do that. But then once you go back, then it is what it is. And then you get to do it again. So this just keeps going because, you know, we're evolving and evolution is slow, but you have to learn iteratively. You have to learn and accumulate your knowledge. So that's what happens when you die. You, you as a, the body, you're not really the body. That's not you. That's just the character you're playing. That's just your, you know, that's your elf or that's your Sims character. It's not a real thing. Yeah. It's just a, it's just a lot of colored pixels on a screen. It's not really a real are thing. Are you familiar with, are you familiar with Joseph Campbell? Oh, uncle Joe. No, I don't, I don't. Yeah. No, oh, no, you're no, both- no, we're not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oh, you're, uh, it just occurred, it just occurred to me that you're both <laughs> Campbells and you both deal with the most profound yeah. stuff in the whole, but he wrote, uh, you know, hero with a thousand yeah. faces. He's the, uh, you know, study of myth and how all like, you know, the mono myth, there's just one tale. And something he said was the, the realization of, well, am I, am I the light bulb or am I that spark that lights up the, the bulb? Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, that, that plays to the, the yeah. avatar. You're not the avatar. You're that, you're that spark in right. the light bulb. I guess there wasn't an avatar he could reference yes. at the time. So yeah, that's, that's would be a good interpretation of that metaphor. So yes, that's, that's it. It's I a very simple to... process. And then you keep going around and around again. And the more you get through it, the more planning you do. And eventually if you've been around a whole lot and you've matured pretty well, you tend to do even more planning because now you've, instead of doing so much gaining experience, you're doing that as well as helping other people gain experience. So you start out and you're mostly student, and then you're some student and some teacher, more student than teacher, then about half and half, and then more teacher than student, and so on it goes. So you just keep learning and there is no end to it. There's... Do you feel like you're more teacher than student right now? Uh, I'm both. I'm, I see... A, I, I see a lot of student in me and I, you know, I'm obviously a teacher doing that, but you know, everybody just is where there is comparisons aren't good for anything, but ego. So I just am where I am and uh, everybody, you know, we're all in the same boat. You know, we look at the people and we see all these people that are making our own, you know, lives miserable for themselves and everybody else because they're greedy and they're self-centered and so on. But Basically, they are in the same boat we are. Everybody here is doing about the best they can with what they've got to work with. Some people have more to work with than others, but wherever you are in this evolution game, you have things to learn. And um, if you've been around a lot and you've learned a lot, then you just have more um, substantial challenges. So everybody is doing the best they can with, with what they've got to work with. So rather than seeing it in terms of good, or better or worse, just see it in terms of we're all in the same boat, basically doing the same thing. And then you have compassion for people rather than, um, you know, the arrogance of I'm ahead or the, or the, uh, uh, what would we say? What's the opposite of arrogance? The, uh, you know, the, the, the hum- humility well, to over yeah, humility. whatever of saying, well, I'm not very good. These other people are much better than me. None of that's useful. You see, com- yeah, compar- extreme yeah, low yeah, self-esteem. Comparisons are just not useful. So you are who you are. You're doing what you can with what you've got, and that's it. So yeah, you should have compassion for everybody. And it's you know, it's not a matter of who's better or who's best, who's more or less evolved. All of that is just ego junk. It means it means nothing. Everybody's challenged. Right on. Yes. All, all this is, uh, all this is just the wisest, most, uh, most live, live your life in this way advice one could ever ask for. And uh, to anyone listening that might get lost along the way when we get into the details of stuff, it's good to always just take away that, uh, you know, don't listen to that fear. Move in, in the direction of not having the fear and you'll see that it was uh, an illusion but it becomes tricky territory sometimes and uh you've talked about this before and that like just walking towards uh, a tiger or something is not is not abandoning fear it's like there's a place for intelligence there's even a place for uh you know non-pacifism and it's interesting finding where the line for all that 
Well, be, is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there being is no fearless line. doesn't mean being stupid. Those are two. Those are two yeah. different things. You know, if you know, you, somebody says, "Well, if you were fearless, you'd jump off this cliff." Of course, you wouldn't jump off the cliff if you were fearless. You're not stupid. You have to be stupid to jump off of cliffs. You see, <laughs> there's a difference. Now, there is no, uh, well, practical, no, no uh, place where fear is an advantage. Fear doesn't give you an advantage. Um, let's say you don't go out in the woods where the grizzly bears are mating because this is mating season and they're very territorial. So you stay out of the woods at this time of, uh, of year and you do that because you're afraid of grizzly bears. Therefore, your fear is keeping you safe. No, that is not the case. Your intelligence is keeping you safe. You stay out of the woods because, you know, it would be a foolish thing to do to go out walking around in the woods when grizzly bears are there and they're very territorial. So that's what's saving you there is not your fear. It's your intelligence, your basic understanding of, of the bears. Now, let's say... Let, let's break that down. Now, let's say going. that you have to go out in the woods because, you know, grandma lives on the other side of the woods and she called you on the phone and said she was having a heart attack and needed somebody to come over and help her find her medicine or something. So you got to go out in those woods. You don't have a choice. Well, then... Let's say you go out in those woods and you're fearless. Well, you that means that you go prepared because you understand grizzly bears in the woods. So you have your your air horn, your pepper spray. You know that uh, you know staring the bear in the eye is the wrong thing because that's a challenge. You know not to run because then you look like prey. And you have all this information, <laughs> which in a, which raises your probability of getting to grandma's all in in one piece. Whereas if you have fear. You will do all the wrong things at the wrong time. You'll see the bear and you turn around and run, which is like painting a big catch me sign on your back. And the bear will run because you are acting like prey. Or if you stare at it or, you know, whatever, you will be doing the wrong thing. So there's no place that, that fear is actually helpful. Fear is always a negative that you need to get rid of. Uh, you don't have to be stupid to be fearless. You have to be intelligent. You have to understand what's going on. You have to make good choices. But when you get to those choices, you make them without fear. So that person without the fear might make it to grandma's house because he would know how to do that and he would have the courage to go do it. The fearful person maybe not go at all or they would get themselves eaten because they would do all the wrong things. So back yeah, to level so the, one or maybe <laughs> yeah, checkpoint. Right. So this idea that fear is a good thing sometimes, it's not. Fear is never a good thing. Fear is something to get rid of. And if you think fear is a good thing because it keeps you out of trouble, that's not true. Fear is not keeping you out of trouble. Your basic understanding of the world and your intelligence is what keeps you out of trouble. Fear just... Yeah, you're giving the award right. to fear when the intelligence did right. all the work. Fear just makes everything harder because when you fear something, you do those things to make your fear come true. If you fear that people won't like you and you're convinced that you're not likable, well, what you probably do is you act real brassy, you become, you act arrogant, or you act like a bully, or you go sit down in the corner and, and are the, uh, you know, the, the, what, the uh, reticent violet, you know, sitting in the corner that won't talk to anybody. All of those actions actually contribute to people not wanting to, you know, come around and chat with you. So you do, it's just the way it is because you put energy, the fear puts energy into the process of making things happen the way you, you, uh, you have your intent. And if you're tense and fearful, you tend to make fearful things happen. So whatever you're afraid of, by being afraid of it, you actually are doing, you will automatically do those things that will make that fear come true. So if you're afraid that your children are going to become drug addicts, so when they become 14, you put them in a closet, slide food under the door, and don't let them out until they're 18. <laughs> well, what you'll do, as soon as they come out, they'll go bananas. They'll go nuts. And the first thing they'll do is run out and do drugs. So you will create the problem. You, uh, that's, so fear is never a good thing. Fear is always a problem. And that's the whole thing we're here in the schoolhouse to learn is to let go of the fear. All sorts of fears. Yes, Another another thing that comes to the when you study any of these uh, sacred text or esoteric things, it all ends up coming back to that answer, which taps into the 
the real truth of the thing. I wanted to ask you, you were saying, uh, yeah, lock, if you were to lock them up, not do drugs anymore. Drugs is a very big blanket term that's changing throughout uh, time. And um, are you familiar with the, the Ram Dass story with Maharaji and how his he gave his guru in, in India like uh, whatever, a thousand or three thousand microgram milligrams of LSD and he took it and nothing happened. And the story goes that he was just so such a good meditator and so already tapped into the virtual realm that he was giving him a lesson like it's it's in you. It's not these substances. And I wanted to ask if you had experience with these uh, psychedelic substances that uh, supposedly put you in a state of seeing through the, the matrix, well, if you will. I have no uh, personal experience with psychedelics. I uh, grew up in the in the uh, 60s and 70s when uh, that was becoming a thing. But I grew up on the path to being a physicist and I, my, my uh, mind was my ticket out. It was my, uh, you know, salvation, I guess. I didn't want to do anything to mess it up. So I avoided those sorts of things even during those 60s and 70s times. But I know lots of people who have taken them and I've talked to people and they tell me their stories. So I'm very familiar with with the process. And yes, taking a drug will put you into um, an altered state that is uh, similar to states you can get into in a meditation. The problem is that if you learn to do this on your own without the drug, you will understand it. It will make sense to you. It will have context and meaning, and you can process it. If you take a drug and experience it, you don't have the concept context. You don't have the experience. It's just an experience. You know, it's like, uh, and it may be a gee whiz wow experience. It may be a life changing. I saw the fabric of the universe unfold. And now I know you're right <laughs> because it was all ones and zeros and structured like a computer. And, you know, I've run into this a lot. You may have experiences like that, but it's just an experience. You don't grow up because you have experiences. You increase the quality of your consciousness or grow up by changing yourself who you are and having an experience isn't going to change yourself. It's, it will change you at the intellectual level. Wow. I saw all this stuff and now I understand it. That's all intellectual. It doesn't make you at the being level change at all. So the problem is that you don't have the tools for converting the experience that you would get in an altered state caused by, you know, drugs, you don't have the experience and the context to convert it into growth. It's just a, an experience that you have. And people think that they've grown. They've been taking ayahuasca or something, you know, 10 times and they feel like they're so much more, you know, understanding now. And they have a lot of, um, of spiritual quality they didn't have before, but most of that is still at the intellectual level. They're, they're acting mm. that at the intellectual level. They feel that they have somehow become more and better, but that falls pretty much in this category of one, uh, what's it called? Um, um, the, uh, the way the human mind tends to overcome dissonance. Uh, if, there's, if there's things we uh. don't want to believe, we find good reasons not to believe them. If we, things we want to believe, we find good reasons to believe them. So if you really want to believe that you are, uh, you know, gaining spiritually because you're taking a drug, you'll find evidence of it all over the place in your own mind. Just like the, just like the mm. guy in New York, who's afraid of elephants and he sees signs of elephants everywhere. You know, even though he lives in <laughs> New York city, you know, he'll see a puddle and he'll say, ah, oh, that was an elephant footprint. And see, see those bushes shaking over there? That's because an elephant's hiding behind them, you see? So he'll <laughs> interpret his reality to be the way he believes it to be. And we all do that. So if you take drugs and you're convinced that it's going to grow you spiritually, you will convince yourself that that's the case. Um, somewhat analogous to drunks who are uh, convinced that they are brilliant, and, you know, five guys together, <laughs> you know, with enough beer and they can solve all the problems of the world just, you know, in one night. And they know they had all these brilliant solutions. They wake up the next morning and knew that they had been brilliant, but they can't remember the details. And 
the people on the outside who weren't drinking any of that beer are not confused at all about how brilliant they were. What they saw was a, was a bunch <laughs> of slobbery drunks all making, you know, stupid comments to each other. And uh, they, they saw it for what it was. But from inside that uh, alcoholic, uh, you know, imbued mind, they were just as clever and brilliant as could be. Well, it's that same sort of thing. So you have to be careful. Yes, drugs can give you an experience that that is similar to, um, you know, deep meditation states. It can show you things that are indeed real, that are uh, connected. It can show you things that are that are precognitive. It can do a lot of things that are that are real things. But the point is, are you going to learn from them? Are you actually going to change who you are because of them, or are you just going to feel better about yourself because you're more spiritual now and go on really being the same person because you don't really have any way any there's no, no part of that process is to integrate it down into the being level it's all just up there in yeah. the intellectual level of your experience not in the intellectual not in the level of your being so that is the problem with the with the drugs the drugs are real in the, in the sense that they do real things they put you into a real uh space inside the larger kinds of system, but without getting there on your own, you have no context to turn that into growth. So most people do not. Now, some people do. There are those people who will take some drugs and then they, they kind of see a bigger picture and that triggers them to go find out more about it. So they, they become seekers, they become, you know, they start meditating, they do other things and it can be part yeah, the saying is uh, the saying is uh, once you get the message, hang yeah, up the phone. Yeah, something like that. Now there are people who do that and they find that it's useful. Okay, but that's just because that that gets them started in a more productive path. But if if your path is just drugs and drugs and more drugs, and it's just it makes it actually harder for you to grow up later because you no longer have the uh, stick-to-itiveness. You no longer have the gumption to do it on your own because drugs are just so much easier. So it's like, well, you could work for 10 years on this process or you could take a drug. Which would you rather do? You see, well, even though they're not really growing up, they'd much rather just pretend they're growing up and do it with a drug than work on it for 10 years because that's a lot of effort. So that is the problem with the drugs. It's not that there's anything really inherently evil about them, but they're not really very effective at helping anybody grow up because they give you experience. And yes, you may take that experience and you may, you know, get it down to where, you know, you see the amazingness of it all, but that's not really changing you. It's just giving you a peak experience and you may, you may feel changed. All right. I became one with the universe and there I was, and I was everything. I was the leaves and the grass and all the animals and, I had no I at all. It was just me and I was all of it and all of it was me. And you can have this thing and it's kind of a life changing thing in the sense that, wow, it's a massive experience. And, you know, you come back with all of having that experience, but that by itself isn't going to make you grow up one bit. It's just an experience like uh, getting on a roller coaster and having one that does five loop the loops, you know, and gets up to a hundred miles per hour and does all kinds of amazing things. And wow, what an experience. And you may do it and do it and do it until you get used to it, but it doesn't really teach you much. It teaches you some about roller coasters and it teaches you, you know, about that particular roller coaster, but it doesn't really teach you a whole lot about growing up. And, you know, just because it's a peak, awesome experience doesn't mean that you're grown up. And just because you think you're grown up something, doesn't mean uh, you are. Something Ram Dass also said was, because uh, he went through a phase of, b- before he developed his meditation practice, he was doing psychedelics mm-hmm. all the time. And he said that the problem with getting high was that I always came down and there was no way of avoiding that. Even if you tried to sustain the going right. into that high realm all the time, you always had to pay that debt. It's like taking out yeah. credit cards. It is real money. You can spend it and get stuff, but you have to well, pay that interest. Yeah, and afterwards. what he's saying, basically, when you come down, it means you come down to being yourself again. You see, you're not all mm-hmm. that lofty. You're just pretending that you are. You are getting that experience, but you're not growing up. So if you did grow up, 
then you wouldn't come down, which was your, your point that you made at the beginning of the conversation. The guru who is grown up, he takes the drug and doesn't affect him because he's already there. See, he stays there yeah. all the time because he's earned it. He is there. He's that grown up. So that's the thing. But if you're not that grown up, then you're always going to crash afterwards because you're really not that grown up. And taking the drug over and over isn't going to make you grown up. It's just going to continue to show you how far <laughs> you you are from grown up because that's how far you crash at the end of it each time. Yeah. Can I ask you about your meditation practice? Because I find myself, um, I, I talk a lot of big game and I'm a big uh, fan of uh, meditation and, you know, uh, self-awareness and trying to, you know, better yourself, have good habits, mm -hmm. take care of your body, all that kind of stuff. Do you find yourself even knowing all this and sharing it? Do you find yourself slipping where like you, you lose your practice sometimes or are you only getting better and better and better with every moment that goes um, by? That's a complicated question because it's got really about two or three questions <laughs> nestled together. So let me kind of prime apart and do each one. Um, where my sure. meditation is now is that I don't really meditate. I don't really do any of those practices anymore because my life has become a continuous meditation. Um, sort of like the, sort of oh, like wow. the guru that didn't get high when he took the drug, your life, when you met it, <laughs> when you, when you grow up, your decision space grows, your awareness grows, and you just live your life every day in that state. You're just, that's, that's who you are, you see? So it used to be years and years ago, I was either here in this physical reality, you know, playing this avatar, or I was in the larger conscious system, you know, going out of body, meditating, doing some other thing. I was either here or I was there. And then it got to be the point that I could parallel process where I could be part of me here and part of me there. And now it's to the point that there's no distinction between here and there. I just live in a large, I, oh, I live in a larger wow. space. So here and there are all the same. It's just all become one process. So when you, when That's you talk beautiful. to people and interact with them, you not only get the words they say and their body language, but you get all the information out of the databases and everything else that's interesting that, that helps you be helpful to that person. So you, you, you see the person in a multidimensional scale all the time. So it's just like that. And you don't make any particular thing of it. It's just, it's not like, wow, look at that. There is no wow to it. It's just life. It's just the way it is. <laughs> so I don't do any meditation or I could say, I never come down from meditation. I'm always meditating, either one. Either I do none of it or I'm doing it all the time. They both end up really in the same place. But now, is it is it natural for people who are learning to have periods where they are very consistent with it and periods where they're not? And the answer is yes. And that's even necessary. Because when you have periods where you're very into it and you're doing it very conscientiously, you begin to learn a lot. You have a lot of experiences. You, you're making connections. You're getting a sense of being in that bigger picture, being a part of that bigger picture. And then you need some time to take that and work it from the intellect down to the being level. You need to absorb it. You need to, to, to uh, take that into yourself at a deeper level and not just have it in the intellect. And those are times when you're not doing it so much. You're like integrating all that stuff you learned into your life. And then when you've had enough of that and you feel like it's all kind of integrated and you've grown about as much as you're going to grow from it, then you'll find your interest returns and you start getting back into the meditation and back into the, you know, being here now and all the rest of that. You pay more attention to it and then you'll get a lot of, of uh, input from it and then you'll have some time to synthesize all of that input and, and uh, bring, it, bring it home, if you will. So, yes, it's, it's good to have yeah. those periods where you're where you're uh, involved and periods where you're not so involved. I think you're, evol you're involved all the time, just in a different way. One stage you're, you're like bringing data in and the next stage you're, you're sifting through it and trying to make sense out of it and, and add it to your life to where what you're learning isn't just an intellectual thing, but it's how you interact in the world every day. You see, if how you interact in the world every day isn't changing, then your meditation is not doing anything. You're just, You're just sitting, sitting there. there. So you have to, you do your meditation, but then you have to take that and own it and 
be it and learn and, you know, act it out. You have to, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? You have to apply it. It has to be an applied science. Yes. You got to apply it to your everyday life. And then when you get comfortable applying it, then you go back and, you know, get another download. And then you have to learn to apply that. And typically we take it in very small steps. You know, we'll get, we'll meditate for a year or two and we'll get all this stuff and we'll really be high on that. And we'll get back into our life and we'll find out our ability to apply it is only about 10% of our ability to understand it intellectually, <laughs> you know, and then we'll get kind of where we feel, oh, I'm just not doing things right. I'm caught up in all this mess and all this stuff. And then you'll get back into meditation for a while and it pulls you up and you'll come back and you'll internalize another 10% of it. And it just keeps going like that. And eventually you keep accumulating, accumulating, and it, uh, eventually you get to the point where you've accumulated most of it or all of it. So that's kind of the way it works. So yes, taking those breaks in between or, or is your application phase as opposed to the to the information gathering phase. There's something very comforting in that. And it reminds me of when uh, Johnny Carson told, I don't know if it was Steve Martin or David Letterman, or basically Johnny Carson told some other comedian off mic that uh, you'll use everything you ever learned. Like, so not a moment is ever wasted. You're all taking in data and doing stuff with it and stuff you thought might have been a waste of time. You do find that you're integrating it maybe when you're 80, maybe when you're 60, some other time when you thought it was, oh, I was wasting my time with with that. But it does have some value, whether it's now yeah. or a long That's time like from I now. That's like I say, you can learn from everything. There isn't any experience you have that you can't learn something from it. Everything you do is, some of it is, is tough. Some of it's hard. Some of it's fun. Some of it's very painful, but you can learn from all of it. And the point is, if you have those experiences and don't learn anything from it, you have to do it again. Not necessarily the same experience, but you have to, you know, keep struggling with those things until you do learn them. So that's the point. If you, if you know what the game's about and you're really trying to learn and trying to grow, well, you can make a lot of progress. Whereas if you're just wandering around in the playing field, clueless as to what the game's all about, then you tend to have to redo it and redo it and redo it. And only very ever so yeah. slowly do you actually absorb it and change yourself. So that's the advantage of understanding why you're here and what you're doing here and what this game is about and how do you level up? You know, that's a, that's <laughs> kind of a key thing because otherwise it just takes a very long time if you don't understand it. Oh yeah, very much. Um, now we've gotten into such, we gotten into such a, so much of the good stuff that so many of my, my other like silly questions kind of fall away. Like they, they just don't matter once we, once we get to this level of talking, like whether it's channelers going out of body aliens, uh, all those kind of things just kind of fall away. And I see that they're just, uh, they're clearly just little games that mm -hmm. the, the uh, material ego self was trying to play to have little, um, I don't know, little stepping stones or rocks to climb to, to justify itself. That more. is true. Is there anything you you're working right. on? Uh, they are, anything... but you know, these paranormal right, things. Go ahead. And of course, in virtual reality theory, the paranormal becomes normal. It's just normal. It's the way reality works. But the paranormal things often are seen as the kind of the the flowers, you know, the, the attractive thing, the flower that attracts the bee, you know, attracts the bee to, to come and get some pollen and share it around. It's the flower that attracts the bee and the smell that attracts the bee and the, and the food that attracts the bee. But what the bee actually is being done is being put to work. You know, he's, he's uh, pollinating crops or something, <laughs> but you have to get the bee to want to do it. So you need something attractive. And often, the paranormal things are like those flowers. They get people interested. Oh, I want to be able to go out of body. I want to be able to see auras. You know, I want to be able to modify future probability with my intent. I want to be able to heal people with my mind. And all these paranormal things are, are enticing to people. They want that because of the power in it. And they come and they practice and they find out that in order to do those things, what you have to do is to let go of the power, let go of the intellect, get into your being level, and basically work from a place of caring and love. And then they work pretty easily. 
But until you do that, it doesn't work. So they get started in this process because they're attracted by the power, but they end up, if they stick with it, actually growing up. So it's a... It's that story of uh, hearing, a you know, like a kid wants to learn a martial art. And then once you actually get into it and learn the martial art, you're less likely to yes. fight than someone who didn't know that stuff at all. It's like in order to get the power, you must like vow <laughs> never to use Well, you find that, that it's unnecessary. That sword. Yeah, it's, once you... Once you have the power, you realize the power is unnecessary. And it's the same with the paranormal things. The people who really understand those things and are very good and and are very powerful in all those paranormal paranormal ways hardly ever use it because the world is just the way it needs to be. People are just the way they need to be. There's lessons for them to learn and everything. Most of the things that happen to them are things that are feedback for them because of the, the way they are and their fears. And you don't want to take people's feedback away. You don't want to run over their free will. So everything is pretty much happening the way it needs to. And there's very little that you need to do to to change any of it. And as far as gathering information, the only information that's paranormal you need to gather is information that can be used to help somebody. And that just comes naturally. You know, information because you have this ego that wants to know because you want to remote view the girl's locker room or... uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> you, know, you know, whatever, then that's, you know, all that stuff just drops away because in the process of, of uh, learning to do this well, you also learn that you don't need to do it at all. Beautiful. I'm, I'm pumped now. Like, I feel like I can just go out and do anything now. <laughs> I've got it all like fresh in my, uh, it, it reminds me of like, you know, how excited I can be when I'm not just over uh, concerned with my own life. Is there anything, um, is there anything you're working on right now in terms of books or big experiments or anything, or is, is mainly your time, uh, giving, giving talks, panels, fireside chats, mm-hmm. talking to, talking to silly folk like All of me. the above, all of the above. Uh, the big thing I have going right now is a set of quantum mechanics experiments that if they work out the way I hope they will, they will um, give uh, lend a lot of evidence toward this reality being a information based reality, toward being a virtual reality. It'll do some things that have never been done before. Um, some minor miracles will be performed. You know, just like the fact that those electrons or photons distributed themselves in a diffraction pattern when nobody measured them. That's kind of a minor miracle because they shouldn't do that. You know, there's no reason for them to do that. Yeah. There are no forces on them to make them do that. But somehow, for no particular reason, they just do it all by themselves. And that's a big mystery. It's one of those paradoxes. And, you know, I just call that like a, a minor miracle. You know, it causes things to happen that, that have no reason to happen. That's kind of a definition of a miracle, I guess. So these experiments will do some miracles that are even a little stronger miracles than uh, we've seen before which will add a little more evidence to this being a, 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 a virtual reality and not a matter-based reality. So I've got those coming. Can you describe the experiments or is I it can, something that uh, people need really, to look up? Is it yeah, too it's big kind of, of a... big. The, the, I, where I'd send people, I can describe them in a very short way, but to really understand them, go sure. to my YouTube channel and there do a search on MBT-LA 2016. MBT for my big toe, LA, because I did, gave this talk in Los Angeles in 2016. So it's MBT hyphen LA 2016. That, it's an acronym within an acronym. <laughs> the, toe, the toe is theory of everything yeah. for people that might not know so, that already. Anyway, that if you look at that, you'll find a talk about science, a talk about uh, these, you know, how, how uh, MBT uh, – does better science and how it explains things that science doesn't know. So it's a little talk about science and MBT. And it also then puts these experiments out. These That's where I introduced these experiments was in that talk. So if you go there, you'll have a chance to see them and, and listen to it and then rewind and listen again. And if you want, you can get the slides from a website, my website or for an MBT events website. And you can actually read the small print on the slides because I had a lot of small print there for people who were uh, more tech, Nickel and who wanted to, you know, would want to look it up and get a lot more detail, but I didn't want to say that kind of detail to a, to an audience that wasn't technical. So you can get all that there. So that would mm-hmm. be the place to look, but it's in general, the, the two 
things that I'm doing. Well, there's several things here. One, I'm testing a tenet of quantum mechanics, whereas quantum mechanics today says, you know, quantum mechanics will work this way and reality, therefore, will do this. And I say, I don't think so. And so it's, you know, David and Goliath. I'm David and all of physics and quantum mechanics is Goliath. <laughs> and I say, I don't think so, not because I'm a, a master uh, quantum theorist, but because of the virtual reality model. Virtual reality model has come up with a really good explanation of what's called the measurement effect or the observer effect. And it explains that very well, but it violates quantum mechanics. So we're going to see which one's right. So that's one thing it does. If it goes the way that uh, opposite of the way you're anticipating it to, what's, what is your next step? Do you refine? Do you uh, try it again? Or does that lead to a conclusive like, oh, I might be, I might be wrong. Could be any of those. It depends on why, you know, where, what happens and how it fails. And uh, that may have some more experiments then would have to come afterwards, but it will tell me that, um, you know, some of my assumptions, and you have to have some assumptions here because I'm not the larger conscious system and I'm not the rendering engine. So I have to have some. I did see a YouTube, uh, I did see a YouTube comment that said, Tom is the LCS in disguise. (laughs) Well, I'm not the LCS and I'm not the rendering (laughs) engine. So I don't know all the. You would never tell us. Yeah. You would never tell us. If I don't you know all the details on. of exactly why the system does what it does. What I've done is I've come up with an assumption that it's the computer science is going to be good and that it's going to do things in the most efficient way. So if you're rendering a reality, you need to do that in a very efficient way. If you do it in a very inefficient way, then you just create huge amounts of overhead and processing and things that aren't necessary. So the system's been around a long time. It should have figured out the most efficient way to do things. So that's an assumption that I think it'll go this way because that's the most efficient, you know, computer processing way to handle it. So that's one thing. I could be wrong. The system could do something inefficient just in that instance because it had other reasons to. You know, it wouldn't necessarily be inefficient mm-hmm. everywhere, but that could happen. So those that kind of an assumption could be wrong. It could be that uh, my basic application of virtual reality to to quantum physics is wrong and i have to rethink that so basically we it would be back to the drawing boards so when you have a theory then you (laughs) go back and see if you know try to find where your mistake was why it is you got to where you got and it doesn't you know the, the the facts don't support it and then learn from that and then come up with more experiments and see if you've learned anything or good enough and if nothing works then you got to let that theory go and say, well, it wasn't right. That theory is that theory's not right. Yeah. And we need to, you know, back away and not make those statements or make other statements. And, you know, so it, it adjusts. That's the way, that's the nature of theory. Theory is not, is not law. You know, back in Newton's time, there were Newton's laws because they were arrogant enough to think that they knew it all. So when you think you know everything from now until the end of time, you know, this will be a law because it's the way the world works then that's foolishness. Theories are just theories and theories should be open to change and open to new information all the time. And of course, uh, Newton's laws aren't laws at all. They were overcome by quantum mechanics, which said that Newton's laws only, only work approximately in a certain part of the world. You get outside of that part of the world, you know, you get outside of where things are very small and very fast and they just don't work at all. You know, so within yeah. that realm of the slow and, and, and the small, I mean, the slow and the big, then Newton's laws are really good, but they're just approximations. They're not laws. So that made Newton a subset of something bigger. Well, that's what I would look for. I would look for what? my own ideas becoming a subset of something bigger. So if I get, if I go and my experiments come out not the way I thought, I think, that's fine with me. I will learn something and I'll be able to adjust the model and grow the model. And it will be a big plus for me. If they come out the way I think, then that also will be a big plus for me because I will know that, that my assumptions were, uh, were probably correct, or at least I had, uh, if they were in, still in error, they were compensating errors of some sort. So <laughs> yeah, you're, you're a scientist like uh, down to yeah, the bone. So it doesn't matter how they, or it doesn't matter beyond. how they come out. What matters is that they do come out, that the experiment gets done so we can see what the facts are, because what experiments do is tell us the facts of our reality. 
That's what an experiment is. It sets up a situation and that situation acts like this, then that's the way this reality works. So it, it creates a fact. And right now I'm knee deep in theory and I need some facts to help me go further with the theory. If you get your, your theory too far out in front of fa facts, if you get your theory too far out in front of facts, you're liable to end up, you know, all messed up not doing very well. You got to keep yeah. the facts coming as you build the theory. So it wasn't that long ago that I started applying MBT to quantum mechanics. And then uh, I came to some conclusions based on VR theory. And now I'd like to see whether or not they're facts or whether they're not. And if they are not, then I need to continue on. And if they are, I need to continue on. So it's, to me, I get the same result in either side. I just continue on doing different things. And not uh, not to rush you or anything, because it's all love anyway, but do you know when you'll uh, know the initial the result? The first experiments that are the easiest to do, I expect I will know sometime early this summer. So, yeah. just That's uh, wild. Are you going to make an announcement regardless of the Oh, sure. The We're going to have the whole thing is going to be documented. <laughs> We're going to have cameras there. Oh, We're that's gonna so We're going to document exciting. the whole thing from beginning to end. And uh, that whole documentation thing will be put out. Sure, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't, you know, I could say that I don't really have a dog in that fight. You know, that's that's not entirely true. I mean, I have a theory and, and if the theory comes out, then I'm more done than I would be otherwise. And then I got more to do. So I'd like it to come out the way I say, but I'm just as happy to come out however it is, because that'll be the truth. And the truth is what important. Do you ever think of how... Oh, yeah. Do you ever think of how, uh, like, the story goes that when Einstein first showed his, you know, relativity stuff, like, the reaction was nothing. Like, no one cared. It wasn't until a little bit later that it started to catch on, but it wasn't a big celebration at first. It was met with, you know, indifference and some skepticism and stuff. And uh, are you going in prepared for that? If you come up with this more and more evidence for this uh, just huge paradigm shift. Like it might take a little bit for it to kind of catch on, or do you think in this internet age, it's probably going to just spark? A, it'll spark. It'll take a little time, but it won't on. take a lot of time. You know, things sped up now, so it'll take some time. But uh, you know, instead of taking decades, it'll probably just take you know a few years. I don't think it's going to be a long time at all. If they work that way, first of all, that first simple experiment will just basically rip up some of the roots that quantum mechanics has laid down and just tell them that that's wrong. So that will, that will um, tear up a lot of things. You know, when you tear things up on people, you know, when you go down and you bulldoze somebody's foundation, usually they take notice pretty quickly. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to <laughs> say, did anything just happen? So I think that will go <laughs> fairly quickly, but in the beginning, what will happen is that it, we have to get it and have to publish a paper and all that takes, you know, months and months and months to do. You know, papers get published a year after the experiment's done because it's a long process. And so we'll have that going. And then other universities will say, oh, I don't believe it. We have to do it ourselves. And then they'll do it and then they'll publish and somebody else will do it. And eventually it'll come along, but it, it's going to take a few years. And I suspect. Do you pay much attention to skeptics? No, I, I don't pay much attention the, to skeptics no. because. I like skeptics, you know, I tell everybody, be skeptical. Um, I don't mind skeptics. It was interesting that when I, when I search for Tom Campbell on uh, YouTube, it's interesting that the second result is debunked, which means that there's people that are like, this is too, it's too much to be true. Let's see what there's debunking. And there's not really much yeah. out there no. saying like giving actual debunking, but it's interesting that the search term comes up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I right think away. that's because they've taken their debunking and they've linked it to my name. So it comes up because my name's in it. Not because the not because the debunking yeah. is popular. It kind of, yeah, yeah, there is no like when you look for it, there isn't really no, much debunking going on when you try to watch the the things, but there's the there's it's like people are looking for no, it, but it's not there. It's um, mostly the people debunking it are people who know almost nothing about physics or quantum mechanics or anything else. And so I've looked at some of it, then it's people who have no idea what my theory is and they don't understand it. I suspect they've never read the books. Um, they've probably not watched the videos. They just on principle and because of their beliefs know that it must be wrong. 
and they just can't imagine. What's kind of cool is you've got your, uh, like, uh, people that follow your work. It's like, I don't know if you actually go on and defend. You might sometimes go into the comments and ask, uh, answer uh, skeptical questions, which nothing wrong with the skepticism. But I'm noticing that other people are kind of chiming in and answering their questions directed towards you for you. It's like, no, he already answers it at 42 yeah. minutes and <clears throat> seven seconds. Check this out. You didn't yeah, watch I'd it all rather, the way. I'd rather other people which, do that. You know, it, uh, you know, it's like a used, you know, like a used car salesman. You know, when a used car salesman is selling your car, you don't really trust him because he has a, he has, a, you know, to gain from the sale. If he's going to make some money if yeah. you buy the car, so you're kind of worried that maybe he'd tell you things just to get you to buy it, so he'd make the money. So you, he doesn't have a lot of credibility. So if I go in and and fuss at people who disagree with my work, it's like you know I'm just defending my work because that's my work. It's much better if other people do it than not me. So I tend to leave all that alone. And most of the criticism is not much I can say about it because, you know, the people have no idea what it is. I'd have to start from the beginning and, and you know, rewrite my book for them in the comments page so that they would they would get it. Now, when I when I. <laughs> yeah. And the books yeah. are free, too. Like people can go read the books yeah. if they want. There's no uh, paywall. I mean, you can buy physical ones, yeah. too. So but. The, the people who have honest criticisms aren't just criticizing because it's, you know, the, it's outside of their beliefs. Those I just leave alone. But if somebody, you know, obviously has read it, they've tried to understand it and they're confused by something, then those are the kind I will I will answer. Because to me, that's an honest question. Somebody's made an effort to understand, get stuck somewhere, and I tend to go after those if nobody else will do it. I don't have a lot of time for that. So the ones that require really long answers, I have to let go. The things that I can answer in a few sentences, I will do those whenever I see them. Um, because that's somebody really wants to know. And I don't mind if they start out their sentence saying, Tom Campbell must be nuts. You know, that's all right. I don't take... I don't take any of that personally. That's fine. And I will try to help them out. But those who are just complaining because they like to complain and they know it's wrong because it doesn't uh, jibe with their own beliefs, then you, know, you can't you can't talk to a believer. You know, there's just there's, there's no thing yeah. you can say. Anything you say will just you know cause you know anything you you say is like throwing gasoline on a fire. It just makes it all worse. Doesn't help at all. <laughs> It, I've been told you have a very hectic schedule and oftentimes you almost need like handlers <laughs> to kind of move you to the next thing because you're, you're very generous with your time. You'll like answer any questions and you'll stay like all night and the building will shut the lights down and you'll still be there. Do you have any, uh, unstructured, do you make room for just unstructured time in your life where you're just not doing anything? I, tr just, this I is, try. This is the, <laughs> I try. Hour. It's a little hard. Um, <laughs> You know, every evening I try, you know, I, I get up at like seven and usually start my day working around eight. And I usually quit at about the same time, about eight at night. And when I quit, I go downstairs and my wife and I listen to audiobooks. So we just spend time together. First, we may not listen to audiobook and just talk and chat, but often we'll listen to audiobooks and that sort of thing. So that's kind of my daily downtime. But I would like to have more of that. That would be nice. I'm 74, and uh, I would like to do a little more of that retired thing. Since I've uh, been retired, I'm working more <laughs> hours than I ever did when I was being paid to work. So, Yeah, you're working more than I do. And I'm like supposed to be in my prime like working age yeah. right now, and you're, you're killing it. You yeah, have that work ethic. It's tough, though. It is hard, and I do. I Well, I enjoy talking to people, and I enjoy helping people. If they have questions and I think I can be helpful – to them and help, you know, remove a block or a, a lack of understanding, then I, I want to do that. So yes, I tend to stay up late, but uh, my wife tends to keep track of me and she'll come down when I'm going on and on and on. And the, the, the Q&A is just <laughs> never ending. And she'll come down and grab me and say, he has to go to bed now and take me away. And that's fine too. I'm glad she does that. But uh, yeah. thank you, Mrs. Campbell. She, so she does those sorts of things for me, uh, and that's good. I appreciate it that she does. But I would stay there. The problem is that then, it, then the next day gets harder, and then the next day gets harder. If you keep burning the candle at both ends, pretty soon you get toward you know you get to the point that you're uh, 
you're not really good for anybody anymore because you're too tired. Do you do you spend a lot of energy on or energy isn't the right word, but like uh, focus on you know diet, uh, exercise, that kind of thing, so you can optimize how much your your avatar yes, can yes. do in a day. Otherwise, at seventy four, I wouldn't be doing a quarter of what it is I'm doing now. I see people my age with walkers, you know, hobbling, uh, you know, down the aisles and and uh, Sam's Club or something. Uh, so yes, I do. I exercise um, two two and a half hours. Yeah, maybe let's on average say about two hours every morning, six days six days a week. Oh wow! I do three days a week with weights, and I do three days a week with core exercises. And after weights, I always do aerobics. So yeah, I. I do uh, hours daily in exercise and uh, I uh, have a, probably one of the cleanest diets around. I don't eat any sugar at all. I don't eat any preservatives. I don't eat a whole lot of carbohydrates. I um, don't eat meat for the most part. When I'm traveling, sometimes it's hard not to eat meat because you, you're eating at other people's yeah. places and <clears throat> restaurants that uh, don't know what uh, veganism or vegetarianism is and and so on so i you know <laughs> oh i'm in los angeles yeah, we're I'm, all about i'm not it. hard over on things you know it's basically about your lifestyle not about you know not about the exceptions so if you have a healthy diet yeah. and then you eat something that you'd rather not but that's all that's around or that would be the sociable thing to do or it would be the polite thing to do then that's okay. It's not like that's a big deal. If your rest of your life is pretty healthy, then those little things aren't going to, you know, make a problem. So I'm, I'm pretty adjustable to life and requirements of who I'm with and what I'm doing, but I'm mostly in vegetarian to vegan, some cheese, some eggs, but they're all f not free range because that turned out to be a hoax, right? You give a chicken like two square feet to walk around and it's called free range. <laughs> but there's a thing now called uh, pasture raised, which means, which means they have to have a lot uh. of space to run around in. Now watch, we'll find out in 10 years that a pasture is only four square feet, but for for now, <laughs> well, we'll get eight, and we'll get sixteen, and eventually we'll we'll hit that number where the doubling. Uh, well, for now, you know, it's honest it's because people magnitude. are trying to differentiate themselves who really are responsible, you know, farmers. They're trying to differentiate themselves, but you know how that is. They'll differentiate themselves, and as they get more market share, the big the big uh, uh, industrial farmers they'll find a way to cheat so that they look like they're the same. So there's no differentiation. So you know, that's what happened with the free range. Free range used to mean the same as past, yeah, pasture raised. And, uh, but then uh, the big, man, you know, the big uh, farm machines, they couldn't compete. So they go to court and pay enough people in the, in the legislature to make a rule that says, you know, two square feet equals free range. So then they can put free range on their box as well. So it's that sort of thing. So the, the, the guys who are trying to do it right, they can only differentiate themselves for a little bit of time before the guys trying to do it wrong will find a way to, to co-opt it. But anyway, for now. Yeah, if only we could, we, if only we could track the source of everything we eat and actually see <laughs> yeah, its history that would be good. with some kind of magic. So I'm careful goggles. about that. I mostly live on green smoothies. That's my staple, which is uh, some fruit and a lot of veggies. Most people make green f smoothies with a lot of fruit and a few veggies. I make a lot of veggies and a little fruit. And uh, that, that's what I – Right on. That's pretty mu much my staple that uh, I live on. So my green smoothie uh, takes – when I make it in a blender, I put a whole uh, 16 ounces, a pound of spinach in it, which is a big box of spinach. So oh, yeah, it is. That uh, – Man. And I put other greens in it too, depending on what's available. And most everything I eat is organic. Um, most everything I eat is non GMO. Like I say, no sugar, few carbohydrates, not a lot. These are so many axes of uh, evolution that I'm like now inspired to go about my day. I'm like, I'm going to have a healthy eating day. I'm going to, I'm going to work and I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose a uh, love over fear or choose lack of fear only to see that the love is uh, revealed there. And 
Um, yeah, I want to be uh, I want to be respectful of your time, and I really appreciate you you coming on for the full uh, two hours and forty two minutes and uh, four seconds that we've well, logged on right wife now. My not yet come um, in with a big there... hook. <laughs> Oh really? Oh, now I almost want to. I almost want to tempt that and get, I'll, I'll hear about it later, get, though. So the, uh, yeah, we do, we do have to wind it up. Oh yeah, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. And I think we'll both because you were talking about wanting, uh, you know, more time, and I'm already charged up, and I I honestly don't have any uh, like it's it's so good. You you teach a way of thinking that. It's almost like I could answer the question like, oh, what would Tom say about that? And then you kind of you you apply it and then you realize like, oh, well, yeah, obviously that's the yeah. obviously that's the answer. And it and it helps kind of override our own negative thinking sometimes to have yeah. someone else uh, say it and live through that. And that's kind of what I do with when I summon you on YouTube and when you're playing in in my head, it's like it's reprogramming me in a way. And it's, it's a wonderful That's the neat right thing now. about understanding this virtual reality concept and what it means to, you know, grow up and increase the quality of your consciousness and what it means about how the physical world, world works. It makes everything very simple. Once you understand it, it just, it only has a couple of moving parts. You know, it's a very simple thing. It's about fear and love. And, you know, it's about, uh, you know, information. So fear and love tells you about everything you need to know about the uh, subjective side and information is about all you need to know about the objective side. And it's so simple that everything becomes easy as far as understanding how the world works, how you work, how your personality works, you know, how your growth and how your fear and love and, and whether, how happy you are and how all that works. It just makes everything simple. But it's not a simple thing to get your head around because virtual reality is kind of a very weird thing in this day and age right now. It won't be later, but it is now. But if you can get your head around it, it just simplifies everything very much, makes everything easy. You know, well, what should I do? What's the right thing to do here? Well, what's the low entropy path? You know, and how will I figure that out? And it doesn't really matter so much what you do as is you do the best you can and learn from it. You see, it's not about being, it's not about being yeah. right. If you had to be right, then most people would never do anything because you never have enough information to know whether you're going to, whether you're right or wrong, but you try to be right with due diligence and thinking about it and understanding it and understanding how it affects other people. And then you just do it and then you see how it comes out and then you learn from it. Did it turn out badly? Well, you had some bad assumptions there. You had some other things you should learn from Then next time you'll do it better and it'll turn out better. So it's a matter of, of doing your best and always learning from the outcome. And then you've got a positive growth path all the time. And the more grown up you are, the less fear you have, the happier you are, the more joy that's in your life, everything works out fine and uh, life just gets good. So it's. Hell yeah. If that doesn't if that doesn't inspire you listeners, then I, I don't know what I don't know what will. And I hope you take this uh this newfound energy with you today and uh make it a a good day. There are uh, Yeah, I was gonna say we say are gonna have to wind up because my next appointment's at five o'clock and that's in that's that's in oh, eight minutes. I got up, another uh, uh I got another uh appointment. Oh man. Well, thank you so much. Let's do our, okay. There's one closing thing that, uh, it is very silly. It's a closing thing we do on the show. It's, uh, it's glossolalia for just a few seconds where if you're not familiar with the term glossolalia, it's, uh, you know, pure linguistic intent. It's some people call it speaking in tongues. It's just gibberish nonsense. It's a thing we do in this show to get silly at the end. And I'm just going to say just some sounds that have no meaning. And then, um, if you choose to, you can do your your own like sounds afterwards that have no meaning. So I'll go first. All right, now your it turn. It just makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Uh, let's see. Um, maybe we can make this a little musical. Okay. 
<laughs> that was a wonderful one. And you're a wonderful man, Tom. Thank you so much. You are an absolute uh, gift treasure to this reality. It's an honor being alive at the same point in history of you. I feel like you're this historical figure that is not this historical figure yet, but will be. But I really appreciate you coming on the show and giving me your time. And I thought this was just a wonderful episode. I thought you, I, I think, I hope you had a good well, time I did, as right? well. It, uh, I like doing these things because the more people find out about something that helps them find happiness in their life, the better. So it's what it's all about is uh, us talking and sharing the word with others. So thank you for um, asking me and uh, making it uh, something that I could do to help. Pleasure's all mine. And uh, one one more thing is that uh, when we when we close this conversation, if you're not familiar with Zencaster, you have to leave the the browser window open for a little bit for the sound file to save, and then once it says save, then you can close the window. But I just want to make sure you don't close it before we leave. But uh, this has been the Rainbow Brain Skull Podcast with Tom Campbell, and uh, yeah, okay. have a good night, everyone. Yeah.